this way it's not like I mean some of them are Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, September 4th special meeting of the Weathersfield Town Council. Um, I'd like to have Kenny Lesser lead us, Councillor Lesser lead us in the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Um, I'd also like to ask for a moment of silence. Um, we've lost uh, two gentlemen in town. Keith Raffanello, our IT director, um, passed away over the weekend. He was um, just a hardworking, really great town employee, um, a lot of times behind the scenes, so people didn't always get to know who he was, but um, he was a hardworking individual and a real loss for our, our town. And the other is Dick Fippinger, um, who held the rank of captain and public information officer for the Weathersfield Fire Department. And he served our community as a volunteer for decades. So if we could have a moment of silence for both of these gentlemen, please. Thank you. Our first order of business will be a brief presentation on the Keisha farm. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, go ahead, Dolores, <laughs> roll call. <laughs> Councilor Breton? Here. Councilor Forrest? Here. Councilor Hurley and Councilor Latina are both out, unable to come tonight. Councilor Lesser? Here. Councilor Rao? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bell? Here. Thank you. Okay. Now, if the interim town manager, Kathy Bagley, will pr give us a brief presentation on the Keisha farm. That's good. That's the gist of my technological 
Accountability Chair. Good evening. I'm Kathy Bagley, the Interim Town Manager. I have a couple of brief slides here just to give you an overview of the Keisha Farm properties. Uh, just this overhead slide here is just kind of a picture of how it sits in the, uh, that part of town out by Highcrest School. Highcrest School is right across the street from it, and um, the larger parcel is, is right there. And just as a point of reference to kind of get a feel for it, this piece of property is probably in, in this part of town the, the largest undevelopable piece of tract of land that's in town because the town is pretty well built out and developed. So just keep that in mind as we begin to look at the slides. Um, moving right along. This actually will show you the different parcels of the farm property. There's actually four different parcels. Thanks. Just, just to look at it, the, um, the farm is composed of these four parcels. And you'll notice the biggest part, this one is approximately 22 acres. Uh, it's the largest tract that, that is there. It's, um, as you look at it, it's, it's directly across from uh, the ball fields and, and Highcrest School. It has the second parcel, which is right adjacent to it, that is a long, narrow piece. So it makes this a, a bigger area. And then many of you will, re will know that this is the lot that has the house on it. So these three parcels, plus across the street, the parcel right adjacent to the school property is also part of the farm. So the, the town is looking at uh, the possibility of acquiring all of these parcels. So it's actually four parcels totaling about 31, uh, 32 acres to in total. And one of the things as part of the purchase agreement is that um, the seller will also, we're gonna exclude a half acre lot in the northwest corner that borders on Collier for uh, the seller. So other than that half acre lot, all of those four parcels are exactly what the town is looking to purchase. And um, one of the things I wanted to mention too is as part of this process and the review process that we go through, the town has a, uh, a purchase and sales agreement, but it's based on certain conditions. And some of those conditions include that there will be an environmental due diligence study. We'll also be doing um, obtaining all our required government approvals, including the approval of the bond ordinance. And it's also required to have vote of the, res of the elected res voters here in town. So there's a variety of processes that you go through to get it on the ballot in November. And um, one of the key things that has come out of this is that the, currently the um, proposed bond ordinance states that the purpose of, the, uh, of acquiring the property is for recreational use, open space purposes, and municipal purposes. So that's what's being looked at and uh, being decided this evening as to how that moves forward. So that's the, the big picture of the parcel. The important thing that everyone wants to know is what, it's, what is it going to cost? And the entire, pro the entire project is going to cost uh, $2,470,000. The land purchase itself is $2.4 million. And then there are associated bond issuance costs and land acquisition costs that make up that other $70,000. And an example of the land acquisition cost is when we go out and do the environmental survey. All of that is wrapped into the cost of the entire project. Generally, the town typically, when we look at a large purchase like this, we look to issue bonds for a 20 year, um, over 20 years. So the estimated cost in 2020, when if this were to move forward, 
and this would end up in the budget in fiscal year 2020, the estimated cost is $210,000. That includes principal and interest, and that will slightly decrease each year as the interest goes down through the 20 years if the town were to issue the bonds for this project. We tried to put that in simple terms, and so what we, what we averaged out was if a, a property lot is taxes are at $8,000, the estimated tax increase to that property owner would be $16 per year. And this last slide just talks a little bit about the timetable, because when the property first became, uh, when the town heard that it might be going on the market and they started discussions with the owner, they uh, worked through where it, at their July 23rd, they held a special meeting to authorize the purchase subject to a purchase and sales agreement that included the different conditions I talked about earlier. So that started the clock running because in order to make the ballot on November 6th, through, um, through a special schedule you have to follow set up by the state, you have to hit certain key milestones to be able to get on the ballot. So the, to work backwards from the November 6th election, the council voted on the 23rd to move forward. August, and they, at that same time, they referred it to our Planning and Zoning Commission, who has to review it through a Connecticut general statute. It's called 824. Basically means they have to review it to make sure that it meets what the town's plan of conservation and development is, that we're not looking to do something that's inappropriate for what would be in the town's plan. So we did went through that, came out with a positive review from Planning and Zoning, then at the council's August 20th meeting, they introduced the bond ordinance that we'll, you'll be speaking to this evening, and they voted to hold a public hearing tonight, which is September 4th, 2018, and um, that was on August 20th, and then here we are tonight. The plan tonight is to do the public hearing, and again, to meet that timeline, we had to get the public hearing in before September 6th in order to be eligible to vote on November 6th. So tonight there'll be have the public hearing. Town Council will vote uh, whether or not to adopt the bond ordinance as is, change it, not move forward. That'll all be decided this evening. And if they choose to move forward, then they'll vote on the ballot heading, which is actually the question, and the referendum date, they have to set that officially tonight, which would be November 6th, the election. And that would bring us then, if, if, every, if they move forward, then the referendum would be held for all our electors on November 6th. And that's just a, a snapshot of the property and the process. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. As soon as the screen comes up, we'll start the public comment <clears throat> on the hearing. We have two different hearings, so we can, we'll call members of the public up to each hearing individually. Um, please state your name, your address, and know that you have five minutes to speak on your topic. So our first public hearing is on the Keisha Farm Bond Ordinance. Come on up, sir. Yep. I know I'm trying to get everything out of your way. And if you would please talk into the microphone so people at home can hear you as well. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bello and members of the, of the, of the town council. I am Joe Hickey of 28 Meadowview Drive. I am, I am here to, to support the town's acquisition of the Keisha Farm, as I did some years ago, the Wilkes Farm, farm proposal. Uh, uh, and I'm speaking as a, as a former member of the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Conservation Commission, and I'm also uh, 
one of the founding members of the Great Meadows Con Conservation Trust. So, so you know where I'm, I'm coming from. The, uh, I'd say the, the proposed use, use of, 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 of the property is going to be controlled both by the physical character of, of the land and the town's uh, uh, needs and, and, and desires. As far as the physical character, as some of you know, the property is a mix of uh, uh, woodland, wetland, and some formerly well-used uh, agric agricultural land. That, that will provide certain uh, constraints and opportunities for anybody who wants to do, do anything uh, with the land. As, as far as the public needs, needs and wants, I understand there is, there is a big push now on, on getting more, more ball fields in town. I, I, I can't address that. My, my children and my, and my grandchildren are past that, past that stage. I would say that you can address this property uh, from both a macro and a, and a, and a micro standpoint. I'll, I'll briefly tell you what I mean by that. From a micro standpoint, look, looking at the big picture, how the property fits into the town, if the Kaiser property were, were to be preserved, that, that would give us a continuous open space corridor or a wildlife migration corridor running from near Crest Street down to and through the High Crest School property, which I think could be a major major asset to the town, something to uh, look at as one of our, one of our prime at attributes. The, uh, along this corridor, you, you've got the town-owned Wilkes Farm, you've got, you've got, a, got a number of other town uh, subdiv uh, subdivision open space uh, uh, properties. You've also got a large tract of uh, uh, regulated wetland, which, which belongs to the country club, which obviously can't, can't be developed. So, uh, so I think uh, when you look at the map, you say, gee, these pieces all tie together beautifully. From a micro standpoint, what do you, what do, you actually do, do with the land? The, you, you, we're going to need, a, if we buy it, a site development plan. And I think uh, it's, it's premature to discuss specifically what that plan would be, but I can, uh, as a professional planner, I can just suggest certain uh, quick points. The, it's pretty obvious to me that, that both the forest and the wetland parts basically are not going to be developed in, in, intensely. It's, basically, it's going to be basically open <coughs> space, natural open space. The big question in, it, uh, involves the, uh, the, the, the farmland, the, the developed farmland, which, which by, I understand is supposed to be some of the best farmland left in the town. What are we going to do with that? Well, that's the, if you're going to have ball fields, that's obviously the place where the, where, where the ball fields are going to go. But as a proponent of farmland preservation, I'd like to see that pending uh, funding to develop these ball fields, I'd like to see the town consider uh, uh, um, leasing maybe on a short-term basis uh, some of this <coughs> developed farmland uh, for agricultural purposes. In a nutshell, that's basically where I stand. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. So anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up, Mr. Gaynor. Just if you speak right into the microphone, that would be great for the people at home. Thank you. I'm Bob Gaynor. I live at 20 Orchard Hill Drive, and I have been a taxpayer in Weathersfield for 43 years. Uh, I have a different approach to the previous speaker. I, I'm, I oppose this acquisition, and I'll explain why. But getting into that little background, uh, I just want to relate a recent experience I had with our mayor, our mayor. I sent her an email explaining that I had received a thank you note from the owner of Lavery Appliances after I bought a washing machine. And I, in my email, I explained to her that I've been a taxpayer for 43 years. I've never gotten any sign of appreciation from the town for the tax, taxes I've paid. Her response was, and I'll, I'll quote, 
The town appreciates payments that are paid in full and on time. How very cold that is. This exemplifies, and the reason I mention this is that this exemplifies the town council's and the previous one's previous approach or uh, the way they look at taxpayers as they take us for granted. You are, my main con concern and crit criticism of this uh, whole approach now is you're presently offering to buy the Keisha farm for $2.4 million plus the acquisition costs, not acknowledging in your press release or the two interviews you've had with the current, the additional cost of interest, which is over $900,000, and I confirmed that with our finance director. And there will also be development costs. That's not acknowledged either. This being voted upon in favor shamefully, unanimously by this town council. I, I see from that there are no fiscal conservatives on this town council, which disappoints me greatly. I'm sure it votes and dis disappoints many other voters. The way you approach this, you, you, you talk about acquiring this, acquiring this land and for possible uses for sports fields and open space. I think this is backwards. Businesses do cost-benefit analyses before they spend any money on expansions. You need to do the same thing. There should be a very detailed plan and justified and find that we don't need to use existing or we can't use existing land. That needs to be determined before you decide to spend more money. <coughs> The, the town council finds it too easy to spend taxpayers' money, that's my position, without due diligence. You need to have transparency and full disclosure for the taxpayers so they will know what they're voting for if you do go to referendum. This must include, as you mentioned earlier, the, the, the amount of the bond plus the cost of interest. That must, must be detailed and shown a total of over $3.3 million. It's not just 2.4. It's easier to make a sale on 2.4 rather than 3.3. I think that's your approach. I may be wrong, but this would have, that's my opinion. And separately, you need to acknowledge that there will be development costs for site development, and all those details go along with that, parking lots, driveways, playing fields, et cetera. And that will be appropriate at a later date. So that's an additional cost to this, this venture right now. At a time when the state funding has been reduced, we need more revenue than we need more sports fields and more open speeds. I'm a very practical person. My position is to let the Keisha family sell their land for a de reliable developer, and there could be as many as 96 building lots that could be tweaked down, but based on 96 building lots being sold for an average of $350,000 million, $350, each, excuse me, would add $23 million plus to our grand list and over $959,000 for property tax revenue. Over a 20-year period, the term of the bond would be over $19 million that would be generated in revenue. <coughs> Of course, the number of billion lots can be tweaked based on what's what lands and that can't be developed. But in any event, it would be a significant amount of revenue if it were developed. You should not be adding another $3.3 million to the town debt, which is already over $72 million, depending on what you include in that. If you include leases into that, it's over $100 million, with the annual debt service of $5.8 million. This is the town's lar fourth largest expense. My solution I propose would be to use, or first, at least study, use existing space at schools for additional sports fields. There are parking lots already there, drive, driveways there, and those fields are already in better position for sports fields. The town should have identified space for field hockey and lacrosse before planning to buy more land. We don't need more open space. Our existing open space is underutilized and not utilized. The 200, 2013 plan for a conservation development report done by the Planning and Zoning Commission identified 28 existing parks and recreation facilities and display, displayed many open spaces on a map on pages 42 and 43. This is available in the planning office. You need to explain, as a town council, how you arrived at that $2.4 million offer and who negotiated to come up with that price. You should have three appraisals based on the planned use of the sports fields and open space. I think the price you're offered is, is too high for, the, for that particular use. My position is you should cancel your plan to buy this land. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarella?
Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. In my opinion, the town has not provided the public with enough information on the Keisha Farm land acquisition to allow voters to make an informed decision regarding the proposed bond ordinance before you tonight. I understand that you feel the timing of this decision is critical in order to make the deadline for the November 6th ballot. However, this acquisition is a significant expenditure and should not be rushed through the process. There should be nothing preventing the town from having a referendum vote at a later date once a detailed plan has been crafted and presented to the citizens, unless some commitment has been made with the sellers that has not been shared with the public. At a recent planning and zoning meeting, we were told by the interim town manager that the town desperately needs more athletic fields, and then a minute later, the statement was contradicted when we were told that the land will remain as open space for the time being. To my knowledge, there isn't even a plan as to what could be done with these parcels. If it's athletic fields, how many fields? What type of fields? Where will they be sited on the parcels? This was a fairly basic question that was asked and couldn't be answered. Much of the land is unsuitable for athletic fields as the properties contain three and a half acres of swamp, per the assessor's card, wetlands, 10 acres of wooded areas, topographical issues, and utility easements. If we were entrepreneurs flush with cash, I could see buying the property at an attractive price and then figuring out what to do with it later on. And if that didn't suit our needs, we could turn around and sell some or all of, or all of the land to a developer of our choosing. But I don't think a municipality should be spending current and future taxpayer money without a detailed plan that includes an analysis of the true acquisition, development, and financial costs. This plan should also include a detail of what a residential development might yield in future tax revenues versus possible increase in town services. Weathersfield currently has 644 acres of parks, school grounds, open space, and recreational facilities. Our physical service department currently maintains 540 acres of grass. The town advertises 37 athletic fields in Weathersfield. I would like to see data presented that shows we don't have enough fields in town-owned open space. I would like to see comparisons to surrounding towns. Please keep in mind we have a near flat school enrollment of about 3,500 students, only a portion of which participate in sports with a town population of roughly 26,000 people. Should you decide to move this item to the November ballot, you must disclose to the public the true cost of the project. Bonding of $2.47 million plus current municipal bond rates will add another $920,000 to the total cost of this acquisition to, to the taxpayers. What are the costs involved with raising the barns and greenhouses which will present an immediate liability to the town? What are the costs involved with developing the property into athletic fields and parking areas? Let's face it, Weathersfield isn't going to just go down there and grade some farmland and plant some grass seed. This will involve much, much more. I envision drainage, irrigation, walkways, possible lighting, bleachers, backstops, fences, and on and on. How much will it cost? Another million? Another two million? Nobody knows because we don't have a plan. We barely have an idea of what will become of the property, yet you have committed to purchase the land. The current wording of the referendum question would not allow the town to sell any of the property. What would the town propose to do with the house on the corner of Highland and Collier? The wording should be changed to allow the town to sell any of the parcels that serves no useful purpose to the town. The text of this bond ordinance contains references to grants and indicates that the amount of bonds shall be reduced by the amount of grants received. The question of grants was brought up at the 824 planning and zoning meeting, and it was stated that the town would not be applying for grants. I believe that this text is mis misleading and infers that the town is actively pursuing grant money to reduce the cost of the acquisition. It doesn't cost any money to add a few questions to the ballot. How about having a question that says, in the past year, have you visit visited the Wilkes Farm property? And another one might be, in the past year, have you or your family member utilized a town athletic field? 
About a year ago, each of you were out campaigning and everyone spoke about the need to grow the grand list. Instead, you are proposing to shrink the grand list, increase the town's liability, and add to our list of non-performing assets. And we will accomplish this by using a credit card that currently has an outstanding balance of over $72 million. Mr. Mazzarella, will you wrap it up? Please? I'll wrap it up. The question Thank for you. tonight is priorities. Do we spend money on overpriced raw land that we aren't sure what we're going to do with, or do we replace a 43-year-old fire truck? I guess if you're voting to buy these items with others, other people's money, you just buy it all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Consul? Please call me John. <laughs> Good evening. John Consul, 38 Ivy Lane. Good to see you all, Council Members, Mayor, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I got in on this at the, at the uh, 11th hour, just on some comments on the uh, land. I'm neither for or against it at this point, but um, I, think you, I think the council really has to make a step back and do the cost-benefit analysis on, on the property. And will the property be here six months from now? I think yes. Will the property be here a year from now if we have to wait for a referendum until next election? More than likely, yes. I don't think there were any substantial uh, private bids to come in on this property. And if there were, you know, I'm not aware of them. Maybe there were. Maybe the council knows. And I, when I sat on the council, you know, we knew more than what the, what the town did. But um, I think the way the land sits now, uh, more research needs to be done on that. Uh, hence, the language is very important and to reflect the total cost. And I think the total cost, as Mr. Massarella and others said, will be in, in the multiples of 2.4 million, more, more like maybe a five, four and eight, four point eight to $5 million by the time we get done. Um, we went through this, I was on the council, we went through this process with the Keisha Farm. There were a lot of pros and cons that, that dragged out for quite a while. And even though there were some developers interested, no one really stepped up to the plate and paid the kind of money that they were looking for. I think the same thing will happen here. Uh, you know, will housing be good? Possibly. I mean, if you did housing right on some on a piece of the property, that might be that might be a, a, an issue that might be looked at too. Like I said, I don't know how much the council's done on that. I do know that many times, listening to the council meetings, uh, the former town manager has stated that the town's broke. I, I don't particularly see that the town is broke. We're maintaining our obligations, but we need to have a better picture going forward of what we have to do. I, for one, know that uh, two of the elementary schools are going to need a substantial amount of renovation, if not a t complete rebuild. So we're talking more bonding there, which means more loans to the town. So we're not talking $14 a house. You know, it's $14 here, $28 here. It starts adding up after a while. Granted, yes, it doesn't look a lot, you know, in the whole picture, but when you start um, uh, multiplying all these and, uh, and packaging everything, it does add up. So, you know, is there a plan for the schools? Is that more important? Are fire trucks more important? Are police cars more important? I think the council really should step back and not rush this process through to see what's going on. Um, I, I, for one, I know there was a couple of towns uh, in upstate New York that were looking to buy property and, and they were having the same type of issues. And one of the issues that came up or one of the, one of the uh, possibilities and, and uh, to solve their problem, private, the, private people came in and purchased the land themselves and then donated it to the town at a dollar a year. So do we have 24 people in this town that will donate $100,000 to buy the property? Do we have, you know, do we have 48 people that will do 50000 Do we have 96 that will do 25000 Well, I'll tell you, I'm one. If anyone else would come up with a factor, I would do one of any, any three of those to buy the property and donate it to the town if that's needed. But at least we could do it that way. But step back. Think about what you're doing. Think about the wording that has to go into this issue. And I, I have to agree, I think we're rushing the process, and this land's not going to go anywhere for another six months to a year if we have to have a referendum on it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak, sir?
Thank you. My name is Bob Woodward. I live at 456 Middletown Avenue, and we've been residents there for 40 years. I think normally I would agree with the first speaker. I'm an environmentalist. I agree with open land, but I believe there's a lot of other issues here that speak to me, and if I had to vote tonight, I'd say no, don't buy it. We have a huge bond issue out still on the high school. Can this be put off? Can this purchase be put off until that bond issue is reduced more? That way, maybe we wouldn't increase the taxes. My taxes are already too much. I can't afford a 41, almost 41 mill rate anymore. A few years ago, and I don't think anyone is on the council when this happened, the town sought to sell some property, small pieces of property that you own. Nothing like the size of the property you're considering because physical services could not afford to maintain them. None of them was sold. If physical services could not afford in their existing budget to maintain those properties, what are you going to do with their budget to develop and maintain playing fields or just to take care of open space up there if we buy this property? How much is that going to cost me in my taxes? The Wilkes Farm got purchased, and then the next thing I knew, you were trying to sell houses, the property, the buildings on the Wilkes Farm. What's going to happen on this property? There would seem to be other ways to buy this property, as the previous speaker mentioned, without, with, without raising the taxes. I think it's going to cost more than $16. If I vote yes and support this, I'll pay the $16. But make no mistake, if I vote no, I'm not paying the $16. My taxes are high enough now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Cindy, come on up. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. My name is Cindy Greenblatt, and I live at 35 Broad Street. And I'm here tonight to lend my voice to the support of the purchase of the Keisha Farm. Um, I tried to assess what would make the most sense in trying to support this decision. And the first is always the cost, as I've heard tonight from many people. It's a thing on all of our minds. And so immediately I tried to turn to research to try to cut through the emotion and really get to the facts. And it seems that in many cases, and you can confirm this for yourselves, that the cost of development is far higher than the cost of keeping land as open space. And if you look and think about it, it's almost counterintuitive because as many speakers have just said, you sell the land to developers, they develop houses, the houses pay taxes, we make out better. But you're forgetting some of those basic facts that exist for all property owners in Wethersfield. Physical services are um, uh, one of the things that the town provides for all residents. So that would be uh, that would be water, that would be sewers, that would be snow plowing, that would be tree uh, maintenance. So physical services would be required by all the people there. Fire and police protection will be um, a afforded all of them. And then education as well, as I sat here listening and thinking about 95 houses, how many children would that create? And what kind of a burden would that put on our schools? I, heard, I read today about the town of Rocky Hill with just 18 additional elementary school students and what that did to wreak havoc on their class sizes. So I think that, that the costs of development are always higher than they seem. And that's one thing that should be considered. Um, there are other great benefits to keeping things as open space. Think, for example, of the property values that surround this open space. In almost every situation, property values are higher near open space than in other areas. It's dramatic in urban areas, but it's also considerable in suburban areas as well. So all the property owners in this area would benefit. That would lead to higher home values and more taxes. All right, there's also environmental benefits, and I read in the... Um, the tree ordinance that's the shade tree ordinance that's being considered tonight, the wonderful benefits of trees and open space, the exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen, the um, aquifers that are filled by rain falling on grass rather than pavement. I mean, those things are things you're going to talk about tonight. And those are very real benefits that every person in this town would derive. There's also recreational opportunities. Unlike the Wilkes Farm, this um, is going to be open to use by people for 
sports facilities. I know they've been discussed, but also passive use. It could just be hiking. It could just be the benefits that we all derive from seeing open space, wildlife, birds, the green corridor that the first person spoke about. You know, and finally, many people have said, wait, see, I consider this a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's the largest parcel of open land available to the people of Wethersfield at 33 acres. I was astonished when the slide said $16 a year. I don't have children or grandchildren here anymore, but if I could do that with $16 a year as a legacy to this town and community, which I've lived in and loved, I would gladly pay it. So I hope that, I hope other people have said, get the word out. Get the information out to people, make sure they're aware of what the cost and benefits really are, and then I hope we come together as a community and vote in November in the referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, come on up. Jim Woodworth, uh, 33 Mill Street, uh, 5H. Uh, good evening, Councilor, Council Members, and Mayor Bellow. Uh, I, um, I grew up on a farm on Broad Street. I didn't think of it as a farm. We didn't have animals, but it was the Willard Comstock Ferry Farm. And when I was in middle school, that's when they developed, when they turned that wonderful field into Chesterfield Road. I watched one, one cellar hole dug after another. Um, <clears throat> this uh, farmland at the uh, Keisha Farm, which they have stewarded for I don't know how many generations and then from years before, um, maybe not as long as the piece that the Chester lot for that was at least 350 years, but still, that was farmland. And uh, I just went to uh, talk uh, uh, up to the uh, USDA NRCS office and, and got a soil report. So these uh, soils are prime farmland soils, and they're actually named Weathersfield Loam. There's a lot of other names. Down in the, on our parcel on Elm Street, it's the Winooski Loam and Ludlow Silt Loam. So they're named for places. But this is Weathersfield Loam. Well, it's the last piece of Weathersfield Loam. And uh, I hope you modify the wording so that you can slide agriculture or farmland or something into that, that referendum because I think that's one reason to, to preserve it. Sure, we might develop it into playing fields, but as many people have said, that's another referendum, another amount of money, other grants, so hopefully we wouldn't have to finance that completely. I have grandchildren who will be playing on those fields, um, and uh, you know, we, if we need them, we need them. But uh, I think that uh, it, it should be partly thinking about agriculture, thinking about the legacy of agriculture in, in Wethersfield, the last piece of Wethersfield loam that uh, we want to hope that uh, there's a farmer out there uh, who would be interested in, in using it, at least until we develop it. Um, <clears throat> we've been, frankly, poor stewards of the farmland at the Wilkes Farm. Um, for some reason, we've said, no, you can't put lime and fertilizer on it. You know, all the lawns on either side, the neighbors are all putting lime and fertilizer and chem lawns doing their thing and it's polluting the, but we can't put it on the, on the uh, hay lot. That's crazy. And then we have a pasture down there that had hay's cows on it before and we can't do that. It's time to change to do that. We, we missed an opportunity a few years ago to uh, pre-qualify our farmland and take part in the, um, Community Farms Preservation Act, that's part of the Community Investment Act. We, we, we're getting money for that for the, uh, or the uh, um, Webb Dean Stevens Museum is getting money from that fund. Uh, we all pay into it. Uh, it would be nice if we took some of that back um, as a possible thing. But if we need the ball fields, then we need the ball fields. We should use it for that. Anyway, I'm definitely in favor of this referendum. I think it should be expanded to, to include agriculture. Um, because of the, the short timeline, some of the financial analysis that these people talked about needs to be done, I think. What uh, described more of the process of due diligence and determining the price and, and you know, various uh, appraisals and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's all important. Um, I, I also wonder what's happening with the house. I know that 
when we passed the Wilkins Farm, it was clear that the house was separate and that that would be sold off, even though not everybody didn't uh, comprehend that, but the town had to sell it. Um, community gardens were going to be developed on the uh, uh, Wilkins Farm, but they weren't. But that would be a perfect, that piece on the north, uh, south side of uh, Highland Street would be perfect for that, adjacent to the school, educational opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot that could be done with this property, but when you're preserving land, you've got to grab it while it's available. Um, you know, you know, might be lucky enough to put it off but, uh, and still acquire it, um, but I would say let's, uh, let's go for it and get it down. And true, the, if you look at your own more school, uh, uh, mortgage on your house, and it's like, oh, my God, am I paying all that much for this thing? But you have to spread over time. Yeah, that's the way it is. Um, anyway, thanks so much. Good luck Thank on you. that. <clears throat> Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Chris. I'm, I'm uh, Christopher Duff. I live at uh, 1108 New Britain Ave in, in Rocky Hill, and I'm, I'm the current president of the Great Meadows Conservation Trust. As an organization, we have not taken a vote or a formal position on this matter, but I've got a little bit of background. I just want to lend some insight as an individual citizen. Um, certainly, anybody used to uh, land acquisition knows that you don't always have the opportunity to pick the right time. Sometimes you have to jump when the opportunity presents itself, certainly when you're dealing with the restrictions that are placed upon a municipality. Um, we had talked a little, or one of the, the past speakers mentioned um, the overcrowding we have in Rocky Hill. Well, in 2012, as a way to help protect our grand list, it's somewhat paradoxically, the voters of Rock Hill supported, actually it was a $10 million referendum to preserve open space. And one of the reasons why we did that is because in the analysis that we did, we found that because of things like fire, ambulance, snow plowing, schools, we found that from a development standpoint, for every dollar that we were going to take in in tax revenue tied to development, we'd have to spend out somewhere between, depending on what model you used, either a dollar and 14 cents or a dollar and 40 cents back out in services. So this development, which sounds good, was actually gonna cost the town money in the long run. So some of that research is out there. Um, and I, when we look, looked at it, the ROI actually did come out favorably for it. When I, you know, we, we looked at this parcel of land being about 30 acres. When I first moved to central Connecticut, I lived at a condo complex that put 188 units on 24 acres. Uh, depending on how dense you build that, that could be a really big strain on your, um, you know, on the town's finances. You know, $16 on your taxes might compare to over $16,000 a year to send a kid to school year after year. So um, I would encourage um, the council and also uh, the voters in this referendum to think about that whole picture and the uh, as a way of paradoxically, um, protecting your grand list and what you spend um, as opposed to just looking at the purchase price itself. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Gentleman in the back, come on up. Yep. Uh, Thomas Gorick, 445 uh, Wilkin Hill Road and I'm a lifetime resident of Wethersfield. When I was a young old teenager, I remember my dad being furious because they were gonna spend his tax dollars on a crazy idea to buy land at Mill Woods. The taxes were too high, he couldn't afford to live here, and what the hell were they gonna do with all that open land? We have plenty of land. Well, I wish dad were alive today. I think he'd agree that it was a terrific bargain, and he would look around and realize that there is no open land really to speak of in Wethersfield. Um, as a previous speakers have pointed out, uh, these opportunities don't come up all the time. This seems to be the last piece of open land available. Uh, I don't think the council has the luxury to do all the groundwork that we'd love to have done, and I, I urge them to grasp this opportunity and move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up, sir, up front. Yes, I am, sir. Uh, 
<laughs> Daniel Andrews, 21 Stonegate Drive, and uh, I am actually a uh, neighbor uh, to this property on Stonegate Drive. It's the little narrow piece that we showed on the, on the chart there um, on the slide presentation. And there's a couple of considerations that, uh, you know, as a, someone who abuts this property, and I've been there since 94, I, I'd like the uh, council to consider. One of those is um, uh, my, on my property. I have, uh, it was the last property on that street up until the subdivision five years ago at the top of the street uh, where two more houses were added. Um, and the easement for Northeast Utilities runs through my property to, to that property which was put in years, you know, in years ago when the Stonegate development was put in. Um, so if, uh, you know, if it was brought in to do something there, is Northeast Utilities coming through my land to put in utilities into this property? Probably. Uh, it's not going to do me any favors. Um, I am, therefore, really in favor of having the, uh, the town buy it rather than a developer, um, even though if a developer did, uh, but what didn't, was not in the presentation was this is at the corner of uh, two zones uh, in town. There's the half acre zoning and the third acre zoning. Uh, across the street on Highcrest, it's half acre zoning. Across the street on Collier, it's half acre zoning. And this property, which has been farmland, you know, forever, and I've watched for 24 years the, the Kaishas go out there and turn that soil to get that tax benefit of having it be farmland without planting anything. Um, and I think they plant some pumpkins on the, on the land over behind the barn, you know, and that's, that's the farming that they do there. Um, so, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of zoning considerations if, even if we wanted to, uh, as a community, buy it and then develop it into something other than, than what it is as open space. Um, just as a, a couple of other things, uh, you know, like I said, I have been there a long time, and, and I wanted to bring up a, an incident that came up uh, right after we moved in. My daughter and, an, and her friend were playing on that property, um, and, and both of them contracted some, some kind of uh, 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 um, rash, which the doctors did, could not identify after playing, playing back there. And, you know, so I would hope that we do soil tests for hazardous waste and other things um, before we go ahead and make a purchase here and make sure that there's nothing that's been dumped there over the years uh, that, that could possibly, especially if we put in fields, cause problems for, uh, for the children that are playing there. Um, and also, uh, just as a side note, I, I mean, I'm visually impaired. Uh, so I sit and I listen and I, and, you know, from my house, and I listen to the, the, the ball fields over at Highcrest, and I know when there's a, there's a game going on, it's like it's play, being played in my backyard. It's so loud. Um, I heard the other, last week I heard the cheerleaders over there doing their cheers as they practice for the, for the high school. Um, and so, you know, adding in, well, I certainly would not like to see developers come in there and, you know, build up that land and put a lot of houses in, because I think that would have a negative impact on me as a citizen. Um, I also wouldn't really be in favor of having more, more chaos over there. However, if you've driven by those fields uh, over at Highcrest when, uh, when there's something going on, uh, we are significantly in need of parking for, for the space that we do have there. And when I instructed my kids how to drive, and I told them, I said, when you come by here and there's cars, you creep down this street with children running across the street, the parked cars, doors opening, and all the rest of the things that go on there. I don't want you to be the one who, who hits a kid out, out, you know, driving down that road. So, so considerations for the council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak out? Gentlemen from the yellow? Good evening. My name is Ralph Moyer. I uh, live on Nine Grandview Terrace in Wethersfield here. 
obviously. I wasn't planning on speaking this evening, but I feel the, like I, I need to. A few of you on the council know that I've served on the um, uh, commission, conservation commission for more years than I like to admit. We're a non-advisory committee, we're an advisory committee. We have no legal binding, we advise the council. And one of our jobs um, directed at us is to inventory the open space in town. And we do that diligently. <clears throat> but one of our projects many years ago here was to go a step further. Uh, what we did was, when we inventoried the open space, and I must say when I talk about open space, I'm talking about uh, north of the flood uh, west of the floodplain here of Silas Dean Highway or Middletown. And uh, when we, what we were given an additional responsibility, we looked at the open space, but with a different kind of lens. We were interested in prioritizing the open space in terms of a number one through six. And then we listed a whole number of criteria that we used to make the evaluation on these things. And then uh, we submitted our report to the council here, and possibly they used it in their discussion. But the Keisha Farm we listed as one, right there at the top. And uh, we've kept our eyes on that as one of the most desirable properties that we would recommend that the council and the town purchase here. It's now come up and become available. It's the last track, the last really large track in the upland regions of our town here. And as many people say, we need to jump on this, and I really think we do. Uh, there are little tracks, and this is probably the largest bond issue that we will issue for open space in the upland region, because there is no more land to purchase. <clears throat> and we need to go on this. I've listened to the remarks of those people who are concerned about the, the budget and things like that. And, I understand where they're coming from. I don't know where I stand politically. I have always thought of myself as a social liberal and a fiscal conservative. I don't know where that places me here. I'm, I'm also uh, recently retired, and I'm very willing to pay the little extra money that I needed here for the bond. $16 a year doesn't seem an awful lot of money to me here. And I'm at an age here, I may not see the full development. But I am concerned about the future of this town, long after I'm gone. And I want people and our children to enjoy this town, especially that region here. It's really the last of this, of the open, big open spaces here. We have recommended to the council that they buy it. <laughs> and before I sit down, I want to simply say I congratulate this council here for acting in a bipartisan way on this particular thing. Thinking of this town not as a Republican or as a Democrat, but as a citizen, and thinking of it as its future here. And I'm suggesting that all of us, all of you on the council, go down to Washington and show them how it's done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up. Robert Gary, 17 Lembo Drive. I'm also fiscal conservative and social liberal. Puts us in a very dark place in this country, but we don't know where we are. Um, so I'm here very opposed to this purchase and um, and I'm someone who would be generally very in favor of open space preservation. And I look at open space preservation as what Glastonbury does. They buy big tracts of hundreds of acres of land that really support wildlife, that preserve you know, special ecosystems. We're talking about 33 acres of farmland that should be houses. If you look at smart urban planning, 
We're an inner ring suburb. It should be houses. That's what we need. I don't think we're talking about enough houses when you separate out the wetlands that we'd be talking about some giant drain on our resources, and we certainly don't have a growing school population. But you know what I do feel very strongly is we really don't know the total cost of this project. We don't have a true accounting of all of our open space today to say why it's not um, possible to build the field, ball fields that we need in the current parkland where there's already infrastructure to support them. And you know, also, yeah, it's great that years ago we bought Millwoods Park. We have it now. If you look at the size of this town that's almost built out, we have Millwoods Park, Wintergreen Woods, now the Wilkes Farm. Um, what giant tract am I forgetting? One, there's one in my mind. But, you know, we have enough open space that we should be able to deal with our infrastructure needs without purchasing another piece of property that's 2.4 million plus the cost of ball fields plus the environmental cleanup plus whatever structures are on the property it's not if, if I was in a town where the roads were paved I might feel differently for God's sake but you know the taxes are high enough and what are you driving over you're driving over broken roads Chesterfield Road is mentioned go down Chesterfield Road it's an embarrassment and you know, my mother's on a street that was built 40 years ago it's never been paved it's it's not the right time. If you're going to bond money, bond money to build fields on existing land and pave the roads. And I say bond money, I can't even believe those words came out of my mouth. But, you know, <laughs> I would support that over buying more land. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Colantonio, come on up. Good evening, Gascol Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I am against the buying the property. Why? I've been here since 1973, and when I was young, I used probably the tennis courts or mill woods a few times. Now I've been retired for 10 years, and I don't use any open space at all. I do have a lot of friends in towns, you know, my age, and they do the same. We have a lot of open space. If we really want to go for a walk, or a lot of times you see a lot of people walking on the streets. I live on Morrison Avenue, right? I mean, if this open space is going to be there, do you think I'm going to drive all the way down to just go and walk in the open space? I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the cost, $16 a year. That does not include the additional expenditure expenditure that they have to make it to, to make all these fields and whatnot. But what it bothers me the most that we always complain there is not enough room in Weathersfield, you know, for developments, this and that. And now we're taking it away. If you build fifty houses, fifty houses at ten ten thousand dollars more, you're talking about a half a million dollars a year worth of revenue. That would go a long way instead of paying more and more and more on a yearly basis. Yes, $16, it's not enough, or it doesn't seem a lot. But I tell you, and you know, every once in a while I say, <laughs> when I bought the house, I used to pay $127 for mortgage a few years ago. Now I pay over $650 a month worth of taxes. And since I've been here, the taxes have never gone down. What do I get? Yeah, the school, I guess I had three kids that went to school, but I've been here now for many years, and the taxes that I paid is much more than the house that I, that I paid for now. <laughs> it's amazing. A lot of times we talk, and I say, oh, you know, where do you live? Oh, I own a house in Wethersfield. Do you really own a house in Wethersfield? Or the town owns a house in Wethersfield? Every year, these taxes keep on going up and up and up. I mean, for these working people, I think it's good. If you work, you get an increase this and that, but you know, social security doesn't go up very much. When you spend like, you know, $8,000 a year on worth of taxes, that's a lot of money. And I tell you, for these people right here, I've been complaining for a stop sign, this is off the side, okay? Been paying so much money, yet I'm requesting a stop sign for the past 10 years and there is no, no one up there that it's been, except for John Consul years ago, he came and visited. But no one up there sees my, my problem. You can, Thank you. You can speak about the stop sign at I know. the I general comment. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Gus. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up.
Hello and good evening. My name is Tamitha Wolfel and I live at 76 Collier Road. I was born and raised in Wethersfield. I've, um, I know the Keisha family. I was there the night of the fire. So it's also a, a personal thing for me as well. It, that, that farm has been there for many, many generations. Um, I think the traffic, uh, I, I'm actually for, for the town buying it. Um, because I think a development would actually cost us more in the long run versus the, the children going to school, um, the, and there would be a lot more roads that would need to be paved and maintained uh, on any developed property. But a, a big concern for me also is all of the wildlife that uh, we have in our backyards. Uh, I mean, they, we had a bear come through a few weeks ago, and it made it made. The, <laughs> It made the national news, you know, there, there was a bear. Uh, we had a bobcat in our backyard tonight, you know. We've had, we have deer, we have a whole coyote den. Where, where would those animals be going, you know? And, and where would all of that wildlife wind up? Do I, do I support the fields? No. But, you know, it's, it's a catch-22 where we absolutely, uh, most of the neighbors definitely want the town purchased by, by uh the land purchased by the town. Uh, I do think that there would be better uses than uh, the fields. I think community gardens is, is big at the top of my list because there are 3,500 students. Out of that percentage of students, how many students play that, um, you know, sports? Where the, it could be a use for the whole town while paying honor to the farms that were there. You know, I, uh, I took a little sabbatical and left Weathersfield and, and moved to Farmington for, for a short while. And they did have a community garden there, and, and it was fantastic. It would be a place where everybody could go. Not everybody has a half an acre of land or even a quarter of an acre of land. There, there's condos, there's apartments where people could go and, and grow. And, and having the school systems there, uh, with the way that... Um, the millennial life is going, it is towards more of um, pure foods and, and things like that where we could teach our children how to actually grow food and, and have a sustainable life. Um, you know, to, to have uh, flower gardens or, or something along those lines as well. But I, I know if we did have the fields there, I think that was a very vague presentation we're going to have athletic fields. I, I, I don't think there was enough information on that at all. Uh, where are they going to be located? What kind are they? Soccer? Are they baseball? Is it going to be? Are they going to be night games? Are they planning on putting lights up? These are all questions that that we really need to know the answers to. Uh, I, I know we're we're under the gun, but I also feel that uh, we need a little bit more information. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? The yellow binder. Good evening. My name is Judith Reynolds, and I live at 404 Ridge Road in Wethersfield. And I've been a taxpayer here in town now for uh, 21 years. And I previously supported the renovation of the high school and the bonding for that issue and the acquisition of the uh, Wilkes farmland. Uh, today's issue, as we've discussed uh, quite a bit, is a proposal for $2.4 million, but with bonding costs at um, an average rate of about 3.66% for 20 years, we're going to be looking at uh, $3.4 million as a total cost. Our long-term debt right now, uh, which is on our financial statements for the fiscal year end, 63017, the last audited statement, is a little over $100 million. If we go back to five years ago, fiscal year end 63012, our financial debt was $43 million. That's a huge increase. That's uh, 2.3 times, or 230%. Uh, our mill rate has gone up from 31 in 2012 to 41. Uh, again, that's a huge increase. That's a 32% increase over a five-year period. 
So when we're thinking about costs, I think we should think very carefully about where we've been and how we've gotten here because I've been here for several proposals which are quoted as only $22 more or only $30 more and it doesn't sound like much and acquisition sounds wonderful and, and so we go and taxes keep going up. In addition to that, there are things that we don't really talk about a lot and they're all in um, the mayor's letter that was part of the proposed budget. A couple of things that I read and I was very concerned about were regarding the liability we have for future pensions, which doesn't get a lot of press. We don't talk about it very much. But um, just to go on briefly, it says we have to increase uh, our pension liability uh, from the current liability of 113 million to uh, 147 million to increase our um, liability to pay debt. Uh, and these, this increase from now to uh, 2035 is going to cost, and I quote, uh, these two factors will increase the long-term liability of the fund. It is clear without a new source of revenue that property taxes will have to continually increase to pay these obligations, unquote. The same statement is made regarding an item in the budget called uh, other pension liability, which is primarily uh, insurance retirement plan. And that is also going to increase without um, an increase in revenue. Uh, the accrued liability for that particular item is uh, $49 million. Uh, we've increased our costs this year by 200000 and we're going to increase every year until we have reached an annual contribution rate of one6 million dollars. So there are a lot of costs that we have to take into consideration here uh, in terms of increased costs to the taxpayers uh, besides just this one issue of uh, whether or not we should go forward and uh, create additional debt through bonding effort. And I think well, point well taken also was the development costs. Um, just the purchase price tossed out wasn't very much. But we do have an environmental concern. We have development costs. We have environmental studies. And then athletic field, um, that point's been discussed. What are we going to do for an athletic field? How much is that going to cost? There is not even one dollar figure put on that. And all these things keep kind of creeping into the budget and adding up and uh, really increasing the cost to the taxpayers. So I think further study and um, perhaps even a postponement for another year until we work through some of these numbers might be prudent. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Hi, uh, Megan Hartline, 19 Rosedale Street. Um, so I am not a lifelong Weather Weathersfield resident. I haven't lived here forever, but I am um, putting down roots here. I moved here a year ago. I bought a house this summer. Uh, my husband and I are starting our family, clearly. Um, <laughs> and um, I, as someone who is putting down roots in this town and who wants to live here for a long time, I'm excited about the opportunities that this purchase allows for the town. And I'm excited that um, the council is interested in going forward in this sort of democratic process of having a ballot referendum. And um, I'm very convinced by some of the arguments that Chris made, that Ralph made, that Cindy made, where we're really thinking about what would the future costs of not purchasing this land be. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends here with young families and hearing about the current overcrowding in the kindergarten classrooms is really that makes me nervous that you know there are all of these class there are a lot of kindergarten classes this year if you haven't heard that have um i think all of them have at least 20 students or at least 19 which is a lot of ki little kids um and if we add a lot of residential space there or if we're if the t excuse me if the property is allowed to be developed into residential areas as cindy said that's adding a lot of potential kids and then we're just going to have to go back and 
add on, do bonding to add on to schools and pay for it in that way. And I'd really love to see um, Weathersfield keep more open space and potentially use that for other kinds of parks and recreation opportunities for our town. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Sir, come on up. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Pasternak, 28 Chesterfield Road. Um, uh, to say if I'm for or against um, purchasing this land, I need a lot of questions answered. I think this is something that the council needs, as other people have talked about, uh, to give us, the whole public, the answer. When you talk to people in town, a lot will say, they see 2.4 million and say, um, it's gonna raise my taxes. So um, I wanna know why are we buying this property? Is it cons conservation? Is it because if we don't buy the property, it'll cost us more if it's developed uh, later on in taxes and services? All these things all add up, and um, all we see, is it gonna be for athletic fields? Uh, why, are we buy why are we buying it? There's a lot, a lot of questions. Can we get creative with it? You have 32 acres. You have a lot of frontage on this property, especially on Collier Road, which I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know why. I don't know if it can be or not. But you can put lots. You can develop just the frontage, which already has a road, which already has utilities. You're already plowing it. You're already paying for the for the electric lights on the, on the street. Will it impact our? Um, you know, if there's more kids, it might add to the school. But it might be, let's say, ten lots. Let's say there's 10 lots in there. Could you get $100,000 a lot? Maybe. That's a million dollars. So now we're paying $1.4 million, not 2.4. Can the council come up with some creativity on buying this property if it's really needed to be bought? And like I said before, why are we buying this property? The, the um, taxpayers want to know why their, why their taxes will go up $16. And I agree with someone else who said, well, you know, there's been other things here. Oh, it's only going to be $20 a year. Only it's going to be, I've heard that before too, and I've been here uh, for a long time. I love open space. I grew up on Prospect Street. There were 44 acres behind our property for 50 years. So I, I do appreciate having open space. But I hope the council will figure out why we're buying this property and try to get creative if we do buy this property. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight on this ordinance? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I oppose the purchase of this property. I don't see a plan. I have no idea what you're really going to do with it except for some diarrhea of the mouth, some little articles of some words. I don't see anything up there that gives me an idea what you're really going to do with that property. Now, there's all kinds of speculation going on right in this room. What's going to happen to that property if the town should buy it? But we really don't know what it's going to be because there's no plan. You have nothing to show us or you haven't showed us. I will say this. We have a lot of money that we spend on sports. I hear about making that into sports fields. We spend a tremendous amount of money. There's a line item in the, in the BOE's budget called extra pay. Extra pay. And this goes to who knows where. But it goes, from what I understand, it goes to coaches. I also know that the town of Weathersfield has no transparency. You haven't shown us that you even can afford to buy it. Oh, yeah, you go, if you went to the bank, you wouldn't be able to get a mortgage, and the town couldn't, because they'd have to qualify. They'd have to show how they're going to make the payments. They can't do that. They're, they're bad. 
bad risks. But they go out on bond. They go on bond because they can tax us. Who cares? What's 16 more dollars? I get, a, I get an increase, a bump, up in my tax bill of $400, and then next year I'm going to have $416. Every year. On and on. And there's no plan what's going to happen. And what is going to happen along the way? They're going to put in some fields. Going to have games. Nobody's going to pay. And that's how it is. If, if you all recall, it wasn't long ago, Mortgage Field over at the high school had to be resurfaced. No money. 14 years of collecting gate receipts and no money. Had to go borrow the whole thing. What, $1.2 million? The second time. The second time, because the first time it was 1.4 because that was the first time they put it down. Second time, 1.2. And no money, no gate receipts whatsoever came in that they could put to the purchase price. Where'd the money go? Sports is a big, big organization. There are many organizations. We have soccer. We have all kinds of footballs and whatnot. We have groups called like CAS. C-I-A-C. I get these names out of the, not general ledger of the town of Wethersfield. I get this kind of information out of the sub-ledger or the, the, the second ledger that nobody knows about. They don't share that second ledger with us at all. And they should be sharing that second ledger. Here's a, a horrendous amount of money Gate receipts come in, a check for $3,100, check written out to CICA, $3,100. This is how you folks run this operation. You have no plan. You should, be put, you should have taken my word long time ago and instituted an athletic plan to how this money coming in is going to be set in reserve for someday the, res the resurfacing of those fields. You, don't, you haven't done your duty. You haven't done a thing. And the town's taxpayers should turn you down on this. I could go on with a lot more. And you know I can. I have, like I said, people should be finding out about that second general ledger they have over at the, 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 the school system. Nobody but me has been into it in many years. Look at here, snapshot. $60,000 just out the window so kids can play on games. I don't know what it's all about, but uh, um, bicycles, $4,000 for bicycles. Landscaping, $10,000. This is in your, this is in your, madam. Sure, but keep your comments to this. Student activity account, and that's where the monies for this thing should be gathering year after year to pay that turf, and now to pay your $2,400,000 mortgage that you're going to take out, or okay. bonds, I should say. Thank you, you. You're not ready. You're not ready to do your, you haven't done your due diligence. You are not ready to go to, to referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Anybody else to speak on this ordinance? Amy. Oh, okay, He's town here. clerk. Would you like him to read them? Well, Mr. Gaynor's had his five minutes, but okay. um, the town clerk did receive two letters from you, Mr. Gaynor, as well as the comments that you've made tonight in opposition to the Keisha Farm property. Is that, is that correct? You've had your five minutes to speak, though. Well, they both. What you did tonight is a combination of both of the two two letters that you've already written to the council and seen. Well, you just want uh, you're against the the uh, farm reduces the grand list 
adds to the town debt, does not acknowledge cost of interest, does not include a defined, justified, detailed use, does not include the cost of development, it's not a wise expenditures. You should, you should write another press release to include 2.4 million bonding, fair estimate of interest costs, defined, justified, detailed use of the land, cost of development, and location of 32 of 32 acres and for the second one you just talked about uh, the price of development would pay about 76 homes were to be built on this property a third acre per lot 96 lots 96 lots spaces for seats 76 lots of houses sale price of four hundred thousand dollars each equals thirty million four hundred thousand Applying the assessment period ratio of 70% is 21,280,000. For the grand list, applying our mill rate, 20.76, is 857,798,000 dollars property tax per year. Over a 10-year bond period, $8,677,980. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no one else to speak on this ordinance, I will declare the hearing closed. Thank you. Um, we now move into the ordinance amending Chapter 153, Shade Tree Commission. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak uh, about the Shade Tree Commission ordinance? Anybody want to speak on the Shade Tree Commission ordinance? Okay, seeing none, I declare that hearing closed. Uh, next, we will move into general comments. The public has five minutes to speak on any item. Please state your name and address when you come up to the microphone. Is there anybody who would like to speak on, public, on any matter? Mr. Colantonio. Good evening, Gascon Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Pay attention, will you? All of you, thank you. I've been coming right here now for the past 10 years. And tonight I was not even going to come until my wife told me, says, there is a meeting tonight, what are you doing? She says, oh yeah, so anyway, I'm here. And numerous times now, I've told you the history of Morrison Avenue. Look how many people that are here now. They, they're going to hear again. This is crazy. It gets me upset. And the question that I ask, do you know why Mr. Trump is the new president? My answer is this, because the existing politicians do not do their job. That's why he's the president. And you guys, I don't think you have served me correctly. Not just me, the residents of Morrison Avenue. Now, I've told you that in 19, basically, 55, Morrison Avenue never connected to Silas Dean Highway. What else have I told you? Morrison Avenue and Hillcrest Avenue are parallel to each other. They are connected by Orchard at the intersection of Orchard and Hillcrest, there are three stop signs. At the intersection of Morrison Avenue and Orchard, there are two stop signs. It was never designed, Morrison Avenue was never designed to connect it to Silas Dean as, as the existing, the existing drawings show that there was a right of way from Tifton to Church was never a right of way to Silas Dean. I asked the engineering department, says, why is the frontage set back on Morrison Avenue 25 feet and then 40 feet on, on Hillcrest Avenue? Nobody knows why. And I asked also another question, why is the right of way of Morrison Avenue 50 feet wide and on Hillcrest Avenue it's 80 feet wide? Nobody knows why. The curb line from 
the curb line on Morrison Avenue to my house is only about 30 feet. That means every time a truck goes by or a car goes by with the windows open and I'm watching TV, I cannot hear anything. The noise level is much more. The distance between houses on Morrison Avenue is 100 feet. The distance between houses on Hillcrest Avenue is 160 feet. And yet, because of those stop signs, we have twice as many cars on Morrison Avenue than Hillcrest Avenue. Tifton Road connects it to Morrison Avenue. That's the worst location on the street. There are a lot of students every day that cross at the worst location on Morrison Avenue. By standards, regulations, something is wrong. The 85th percentile, and I'm looking at the clock, the 85th percentile goes 31 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25. And that intersection, the new intersection after the construction, does not meet requirements. And yet, nobody's been there to see my concern. And yet, I've been an engineer for 37 years. I think, or I like to think that I know what I'm talking about, and nobody cares. I requested a meeting between the town engineer, the town manager, and the police department two, two months ago. I stopped by today again to remind her that I'm still interested for the meeting. Why? Because for the last 10 years I've been here and the conversation is from one end to the other, but not back and forth. So I would like to talk with them. I would like to know why it's been this long and why all these changes on Morrison Avenue that created twice as many cars as Hillcrest Avenue. Now, I don't have a meeting yet, but I tell you, I'm not gonna go away because the way you guys have been treating the residents on Morrison Avenue, it's unacceptable. I don't think you're doing your job as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up, Rob. Robert Gary, 17 Lemo Drive. Even though I don't live on Morrison Avenue anymore, I still do use it as my cut through because it doesn't have a stop sign. So I do want to I do want to acknowledge that. I go really slowly by D Gus's house though because I'm afraid of him. So, but it is much easier than Hillcrest, which I also used to live on. Uh, but I'm here for, uh, tonight representing the Weathersfield Village Improvement Association. Being here tonight for this other hearing, I remembered that I was remiss in not coming back and thanking the town as always for your support in our Arbor Day celebration. And um, we had another great weather year and another great uh, celebration. And we're happy to be part of that requirement that keeps us a Tree City USA. You know, one of which is that we have the Arbor Day celebration. Another of which is that we spend X dollars per capita on our tree budget, which I don't remember that number and Corey's left. But um, you know, we meet the minimum standard and we do a great job and we've you know, had that designation for many years, but I do the fiscal conservative want to stand here and ask for more money. I think we put something like $3,000 a year into the tree fund, and it's really not a, it's not a significant number at all with regard to the budget. But a small change in what the town contributes to the tree fund would have a huge impact on what Corey's team is able to do. So I really ask you when you're looking at the budget next time to think about doubling that number at least you know, to help us to do more, not just tree maintenance, but more tree plantings. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Cindy? Uh, good evening, Cindy Zerbos, 119 Turad Highway. Yep, I'm back again. I'm looking for money again. <laughs> Sorry, but um, no, seriously, all kidding aside, I'm actually here to support the fire department um, for the purchase of fire trucks. And I'm going to, just a disclaimer, it's not because my husband's a fireman. It's because I'm a resident, and it's also because I work at DMV. I know a lot about truck safety. I know that we have two fire trucks in the fleet right now that are 1975. And um, that one, one of them's 1975, 1975, 
and that makes it 43 years old. It was refurbished, I guess, back in 1992, putting it at about 26 years old. Um, there's another one that was uh, 1989, making it 29 years old. So those are some really, really old trucks. And I just want to let you know, I'm a 33 year vet veteran at DMV. I worked in the truck safety division. I just want you guys to realize, I know it's a lot of money to replace a fire truck. I get it. But th I want you guys all to think back to 2005, because I was at DMV then, and I want you to think about Avon Mountain Crash. And let me just point out to you guys, that was a small dumb truck. You think about a fire truck being in the same accident. Four people got killed in that, numerous people got injured. So just think about that when you're deciding whether or not you're gonna spend money or not on a new fire truck. These trucks can only last for so long. Things start to go wrong on them. So you really need to you know, make sure that you're thinking about spending the money properly. Spend it now, be proactive. Being a state employee for 33 years, that's something I see constantly throughout the state. We're reactive. Be proactive. Spend the money now. Get the fire truck. I cannot get both the fire trucks if, if you can. I can't stress that enough to you because you do not want an unsafe fire truck out there. I know that the fire department's out there. They, the guys that are on the, in the departments, they're maintaining them and stuff. But after a while, it doesn't work, you guys. You can't keep putting Band-Aids on those things. So I can't stress that to you guys enough. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Young. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. As far as that fire truck goes, I mean, we've we botched so many so far. So, you know, all along, they're millions of dollars each. We don't need any more of those. We, we, we have the biggest and the greatest when we go to the fir but when we go to the parade, that's all we see is Weathersfield, big, big fire engines. We go to, the, we see other towns with big fire engines. We don't need these big things and we don't need the big price tags either. What we need to do is be sensible in how we spend our money. Now, talking about spending our money, I believe it was probably a month ago, July 19th, there was a discussion here regarding uh, the bike center, the bike repair center here at Town Hall. I'm sure that cost us some money. I believe it was uh, Miss Breton who had spoke about it because she was the liaison between the health district, if that's what it was called. And it was the health district that put this bike repair thing in over next to the, over next to the uh, library. I mean, why in the world are we spending this kind of money? Well, I don't care what kind of money it is. We shouldn't be doing this. We should be holding back. But I guess when we, when it's other people's money, who gives a who, right? And that's just how it is. You know, I, I mentioned a little while ago up here at the first time to speak about the second general ledger over at the Board of Education, something that uh, Tony, Tony is the finance guy between the BOE and us. He never talks about that ledger called the Student Activity Fund, where there's all kinds of expenditures in there. You know, I'm looking at one right now. It's called PayFlex ACH. PayFlex ACH. The year 2016, we ACH'd. I guess that's a bank term for sending money somewhere else, $75,500. The next year, 2017, it was another $5,102, $51,200. That totaled $126,000 to go somewhere, somewhere. But we never hear anything about this, Tony. And I've been watching that account for some time now. And I see things in there that I don't like at all. I see things in there that belong in the budget and the, the general ledger of the Board of Education, not in an off ledger general ledger. That general ledger is only meant for in money from children or students to, to pay for photographs. The photographer who comes in and takes pictures of the kids. I mean, that's one example not buy, make payments for labor. 
We see in here buying buildings, sheds, $14,000, $3,500, going over to the high school. They have no business buying this stuff. And we're broke because of this. When you got to ready to put turf on the field, you had, they had no money to give you because they spent it all other ways. And here we are gasping for, uh, as taxpayers, gasping. But nobody gives a damn. Now a deal comes along that you think is a deal. And I'm sure Mr. Forrest had a lot to do with that deal. And I wouldn't trust that deal at all by, with Mr. Forrest because we've seen other deals that he has worked on or voted on here at the town of Wethersfield that were pretty damn bad for us citizens. But he doesn't care. He, he ran again and got elected. He snookered a lot of people. 2004, when he voted to eliminate the second public comment section of the town council meeting. And then, of course, just last, last month, his, the Forest Commission came out with eliminating, the, the, again, the, the second comment section of the, public, of the town council meeting. And thank goodness for some citizens, some uh, council members up here, they, it backed off. But you got a heck of a reputation, Mr. Forrest, and I, I wouldn't trust this, this agreement coming up on this uh, uh, land purchase. I, I, I just don't have any confidence in you. You have proven us so badly, so many times. There's no confidence that I can see coming on your sitting up here. Hey, Mr. Young, and then of course we have up. Tony. Then of course we have please Tony. Wrap up. I'll wrap it up. Thank then we, of course we have Tony sitting right next to you, Mayor, who, who would like to find ways to reduce the, 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 student, the um, public from speaking. We got that at that 19th or whatever day that was uh, meeting back in July. And of course you, Mayor, you're, you're the top person for transparency. When are we gonna start seeing our, our checkbook on, online so I can go in and look at it where I don't have to wait until the end of the year and, and months later and ask for it and then wait several months for it. When are we going to start seeing that? You were, okay. you were bragging that you were the transparency queen. Let's Thank see you, what you Mr. can do. Young. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarella, come on up. Evening again, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I just want to touch briefly on uh, item B3B, the purchase of four police vehicles. And uh, I'm going to give Gus a run for his money and keep harping on the same topic week after week. I would like to see more information provided to the town citizens, taxpayers, on why we need to replace police vehicles on a scheduled interval. Uh, there's no, nothing in this document that indicates that the vehicles being replaced have high mileage, that they are in poor condition. Uh, no details whatsoever on as far as if they have a history of continually breaking down and being out of service no information as to the amount of money and in parts and labor that have gone into these vehicles to keep them on the road and i just don't see any reason why we have to buy police vehicles four at a time to meet a requirement that somehow is cast in stone of a, a replacement schedule I guess the word that they use in the justification is that they are past their life cycle. Well, tonight before you, you also have the fire department that's going to get up here and speak about fire trucks. And they're asking to replace a fire truck that's 43 years old. 43 years old. And that truck is in service, and it's well maintained. I believe that the town of Weathersfield would not allow a fire truck to operate on our roads with faulty brakes or faulty equipment that would pose a risk to anybody, the, the volunteer firemen or the people that are out on the roads. 
just wouldn't happen. They're looking to replace the vehicles because the parts are becoming increasingly hard to find for these trucks. In many cases, the parts may have to be manufactured, which can be done, would keep the truck out of service for a lengthy period of time. So yes, at some point, it does make financial sense to replace a vehicle. But you're not going to tell me that these four vehicles that are being replaced for the police department are 43 years old. I, I, I venture to guess that they're less than 10 years old. I may be wrong. But that, that information isn't even provided. We don't have a listing of all the police vehicles like we do for the fire department. They've listed all their trucks, the year of manufacture, and they range from a low of three years to 43 years. I just think that the town could do a much better job of providing data so that you can make an educated decision about when to replace a vehicle and to just go out and continually replace them on a calendar schedule does not make any sense. I happen to have worked with an individual that was a town selectman in one of the Farmington Valley communities. Their plan was to buy used police vehicles from other towns, other towns that have a system such as Weathersfield, where they replace the cars when they're in very good condition. And a few phone calls would be made between the towns, and they would talk to the people in the maintenance, and they'd say, there's nothing wrong with those cars. And they would buy these police vehicles, in some case, fully outfitted, change the logo on the side of the car, and operate a used police vehicle for another five years. So, I mean, it's obvious. There's, there's nothing wrong with the vehicles. If the seats wear out, Get the seat reupholstered. I did that in my truck. My truck's eight years old. There's nothing wrong with it. I have no intention of replacing it. I do routine maintenance. Cars uh, require brake replacement, tires, front end suspension parts. These are routine items. That's the cost of operating a vehicle. We're not talking about engines that need to be replaced. These cars don't even have that many miles on them. But at least you could ask for physical services to provide everybody with the information so you can make a sound decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, sir. I didn't want to talk tonight. Tom Linden, 39 Parkview Drive. Um, I've lived in Weathersfield for 48 of my 56 years. My father was born in this town in 1930, and other than probably about six years when he first got married and started a family, they lived in Rocky Hill, moved back to Weathersfield in 1966, and was here until the day he died. And unfortunately, I plan on doing the same thing. <laughs> um, it absolutely amazes me when I used to run and volunteer at Weathersfield Community Television. We used to come to town council meetings and record them with a video recorder and a VHS tape, and we played it back the next night. None of this fancy stuff. Um, it absolutely amazes me. The same thing happens now that happened back then. Everybody comes in for a public hearing. They say their piece, nicely or not nicely, and the second it's done, they all walk away, and they don't listen to what you people are going to say or how the vote's going to go. Um, what I would just like to say, f forgetting what happens, what happened tonight, is what people seem to forget when they come and address the council. You people are volunteers. You don't get paid to do this. You volunteered to do this. What's wrong with your minds, I don't know. But you people <laughs> volunteered to do this, and we elected you to do it. So. You deserve our respect when you're being addressed. You shouldn't be berated or demeaned or yelled at. People need to have a little bit more decorum when they come into this council chamber and talk to you. You're volunteers. And for that, I applaud you and I thank you for what you do. It doesn't matter how you stand on an issue. You deserve our respect. So thank you very much.
Thank you. I appreciate your comments. <laughs> Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing no one else to speak, we will close public comments. On to council reports. Any council members have a report to make? It's hot outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great report. Thank you, Councilor Forrest. Yeah. Any council comments this evening? Wow. Well, we're quiet. Um, town manager's report. No report. Okay. Town clerk's communication. Uh, we have an election coming up <laughs> November 6th. Okay, very good. And everything, uh, absentee ballots will be available for it um, on a, a, October 5th. October 5th they'll be available? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good information for all those college kids out there who are not in town to vote, like my daughter. Um, all right, moving on then. We will move into council action. Um, I, we do not have any um, resignations from boards and commissions. We do have um, a list of appointments for boards and commissions, um, but I think speaking to some council members before the meeting, we feel that we're not prepared to act on them this evening because we just received them today. I don't want to misspeak. Um, do others feel the same way? Yeah, that's accurate. Is, is there a concern with timing of any of these? Are there any appointments that need to be filled? I believe the current appointments run until they've been filled. Okay. So I don't see any interruption in any of the boards and commissions. They, they'll continue on as, as they exist currently. Is that correct? I'm asking the town attorney in the audience. Well, you serve until your successors appointed, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, Dolores, do we need to table them no. or not? Because we haven't actually had it. Okay. Thank you. So we will hold them off till the next meeting. Um, next is the approval of the Keisha Farm Bond Ordinance. Do I have a motion? Make a motion uh, for the adoption of the following bond ordinance. Ordinance appropriating $2,470,000 for costs with respect to the acquisition of the Keisha Farm property on Highland Street for recreational, open space, and other municipal purposes and authorizing the issue of bonds and notes in the same amount to finance such appropriation. Do I have a second? <clears throat> second. Okay, thank you. Do I have council comments or questions? Kathy, did you want to make some comments or the town uh, attorneys in the audience as well to answer questions? Before, I was just looking down to see. Sure. Okay. Councilor Rell, you want to begin? Um, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. This was a uh, pretty heated and passionate debate on both sides of the issue. Um, this isn't something, you know, this council of just seven of us uh, should take lightly. Um, I do support the fact that uh, going out to the public, as I forget who mentioned it, but somebody should um, take credit for uh, saying that this isn't just a decision that is made by the body of you know, the, the council up here, but this is a proposal that will go forward. And you know, we, as a council, should do our homework to know more about what's planned for this uh, um, 33 acres. Um, I think we, it's a disservice to the public by not giving them the full information. I mean, how long did it take Millwoods to go from a proposal, as that gentleman had said, uh, Mr. Gwark, from a proposal to plans to a reality, and now, you know, 40 years later, um, a parcel of property or open space that the town utilizes. I think we need to know some of that information. I don't know if we can get it um, in time for the next council meeting, but I think we should get as much information to the public as possible before they vote uh, in November on, uh, on the proposal. Um, if that's something we can do, um, can I entertain a, you know, a question to either council or to uh, um, interim town manager? 
the interim town manager and I did have some discussions on that, and um, there was a master plan for Mill Woods. It's not something that can happen in, quickly. Um, I believe the master plan took between nine months and a year to prepare. You know, the town council hired an outside firm to come in, and they would look at our our fields in town, um, and they would also look at that that parcel, you know, in itself to see what kind of use it is. We've heard tonight there's forest woodland areas, there's inland wetlands. So clearly we can't put field on every inch of that property. There would be open space um, in inland wetlands type environment for um, some wildlife. But I guess the, the, the answer is we can't get those answers between now and November. Um, and it is, it is difficult. We're in a difficult position because um, the property owner had discussions with the developer and we wanted to make sure we had a seat at that table and we did get a seat at the table and so that we, you know, we did negotiate with, with the family. Um, and so we are, we are in a position that's not, that's not perfect because we don't really have the time to do a nine month to a year um, master plan of that property or to, to do a um, town-wide survey of all the lots. Um, and Kathy can, can also speak to this because we, I did have a conversation with Kathy last week about it. Um, but I, I do feel there's an urgency in putting this on the November ballot because we have a property owner who has a parcel of land in town that he doesn't have to sell to us, he can sell to somebody else. Um, and so for those reasons, I do think it's important that we vote on this tonight. Um, and we are voting to put this on the ballot. We're not voting, we're, we're not making the final decision. That final decision is in the hands of the voters of the town of Wethersfield. We're putting this out to you, um, and we will get you the information that we can get in between now and November. Um, but we're certainly not going to be able to do a full-scale park plan or um, a full-scale analysis of all the fields in, in town um, in, that, in that period of time. And there will be other expenses incurred. Um, the, the, the survey or the plan for the park will have an expense. Um, and then, like Mill Woods, over time, fields would be put up and um, Town funds would be used or donations would be used. Some of the sports teams have donated for some of the fields in Mill Woods. So it would definitely be a partnership and it would be a long-term proposition. It's not, we're not gonna purchase this field in November if you, it, these, this property in November, if you um, approve it and have ball fields on it in the next spring, that's not realistic. Still have a couple more. Of course, of course. Uh, there's property behind Back Lane that we voted on. Um, I don't think it was this council, but the council um, before this for the development. And I remember going to Chief Bailey and asking him about the um, concern about getting fire trucks and apparatus into that Back Lane area. Um, it's my understanding there's about 40 lots that are in three separate divisions. Do we know, and maybe Tony from your years on uh, staff here, how long those developments or those proposed developments have been on the books? Do we know? The ones on back lane, they go back probably to, I'm guessing the 90s. And I'm just taking a shot in the dark because they were there when I came to work here. They probably might go back further than that. Okay. I mean, people have owned the land and they've waited. but. Once again, yeah, we had to do something for those developments when he decided to go through because of the fire trucks. But if a development went into, say, the Keisha property, whatever plan the developer came up with would have to go through planning and zoning and the various departments in advance, design review and the whole thing. And that's where the fire department would get involved to make sure that you know the, the roads were proper to be able to handle their trucks in and out of there. Right. you know that they could do the snow removal my concern is not so much the public safety aspect but how long we would wait to see development if we decided to go the development route and not buy the property for open space but let the Keisha family sell to a developer rarely do we see any 
open space purchase developed within a year, five years, even 10 years. I mean, this has gone nearly 30 years, if your you know, memory serves you correct, Tony. Um, so we don't see that Keisha property being developed, at least I don't, within the foreseeable future. So there probably will not be a, a strong drain or a serious drain on town resources in the near future. Um, so it kind of puts this decision um, that we have to make, and actually the public's decision um, they have to make, into a difficult proposition. Do we preserve open space for something that we don't know what's going to go there, when it's going to be done, what impact that is going to have on our checkbook here in town. And then on the other side with the development, we don't know when the first backhoe is going to go in there and start developing. I mean, this, this could be property that just sits there for 20 years and we've paid a little over, what, 3.4 million total costs with interest, um, uh, bond issuance, as well as, um, you know, the original purchase price. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see anything happening to this property the way the town goes for the next five to ten years. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that's the way I feel. Um, this, hearing the you know the concerns of everybody who's out there, um, you know, this really is a decision that needs to be made by the public. Um, listening to some neighbors that I know that don't live in the chest or in the uh, um, Collier uh, neighborhood, say you know sixteen dollars. Who cares? You know, it's just a couple bucks more. I, I went through my taxes, and my taxes in the last three years have gone up nearly eight hundred dollars, um, just simply on the mill rate. You know, Board of Education, I think, is a driver. This definitely the town council has been a driver on on a lot of those um, increases. Uh, for sixteen dollars, I could see um, purchasing this property and holding on to it so that uh, um, we keep open space here still in, in town. Um, I think that um, those neighbors that I've talked to that are closest to the property, uh, I've talked to folks on Stonegate who are concerned about um, possibility of parking lots, lights, um, errant balls, believe it or not, have come into conversations from people that I know who live in that area. Um, but the majority of those who, who live in the vicinity of this property um, want to have it preserved uh, as open space. And uh, I think, you know, we do represent the entire town. You know, we, we are not, you know, um, delegates for certain parts. So I do take in the concerns of those who don't live in the area as well as those concerns of those that do live in the area. And I think that the concerns of those who live in the area outweigh the, the greater uh, town um, in the sense that we vote for this just to go on the ballot this November. And I think we leave it up to the voters to um, make that final decision. I really hope we do our homework and we present to the public some more information before they go and vote. Um, I also think that the those who vote and, and the residents who have a concern do their homework as well and get their point across, be it for development or for um, preservation. I think um, it is a, it's a big enough decision that all parties should weigh in. Any kind of concerns, there should be um, information that is relayed on to the public through the town council, through uh, the town manager's office to be able to answer any questions going forward. Um, and with that said, uh, I will be supporting this uh, proposal uh, simply because I think um, we should be preserving open space in town. Um, I don't oppose development. I just don't think that we would see any benefit of development anytime soon, nor would I see any you know, uh, benefit of um, 
ball fields or anything like that because we just don't know if that's going to happen. But I think we should preserve it at least for the time being as open space. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I just want to make one comment and then I'll give, give you the floor. Um, I think that the, the back lane parcels was not a great example because um, many of those pieces were landlocked. And so the, the reason that's, that that development sat for so long was um, they needed to get some of the key, key pieces in order to go back into the woods behind back lane to get that development going. Um, in my lifetime, I remember the apple orchard, which became um, a housing development, Straddle Hill, which became a housing development, Windmill Hill, Nathaniel, um, Hawthorne Lane, uh, Hawthorne. Um, Bailey's. Uh, Bailey's. I, I, you know, these parcels that sold, a developer came in, La Cava, um, Drisdell, they, they bought the parcel, they came in, they had a subdivision, they went to planning and zoning, and they built their houses. Um, so would, would that happen in the spring? No. Um, but I think that the foreseeable future, there would be houses on those parcels. That's my feeling. It's prime real estate. It's across from the school. It's flat. Um, it, it would be easy, in my opinion, it would be easy to um, turn that into a subdivision pretty quickly. And that's that, you know, I, I think that the, those other uh, subdivisions like Windmill and Straddle Hill are probably more in line with the type of development that would happen here, and it would probably happen sooner rather than later. Um, but anyway, that's just just my two cents. Um, Deputy Mayor? Uh, I just, I was thinking more about what Mike said and why it took so long. And yet, if you think about it, a couple of years ago, we did approve that triangle, because when we bought the property, that triangle was the piece they needed because that property back there only had one way to get into, and for safety reasons, you needed two ways. And Mr. Wilkes controlled that whole area and didn't want it to develop, so he went to sell off that one little triangle piece that was necessary to do it. So when the town bought it, we did it with that separate so that we could then make it available so that fire trucks had, and public safety and emergency fields had two ways of getting in and getting out if they had to. So that's why that one took too long because it was, you know, they didn't have the access they needed to do the work and partially being landlocked. That's why that took 30 years plus. Uh, this property, on the other hand, I mean, there's a developer in the wind waiting to take it over. My guess is he or she would purchase it and turn around and, you know, depending on how long to get financing, and we start working on it, and it might take a year or two. But if it went to a developer, then the chances of us ever getting, getting it would never happen. We all agreed when we met to move forward with it to take the option to try to buy it when the, he offered to us first. And it's not our decision. We're putting it out there to go on a ballot for the public in general to decide on. I've had people call me with some questions and I've gotten them answers you know, where I could so far. And I think we would continue to do it up until the ballot. Yes, we did hear from a lot of people pro and con tonight. And there's many more that aren't here that are, you know, either watching us at home or will be thinking about it later. But, uh, I mean, this is the year of a state and federal election, which means more people will be coming out to vote. So we'll get, I mean, we heard from a percentage of people here tonight, but that percentage compared to the entire town is minimal in, in comparison to the people that will vote in November. So we'll get from them the direction to go with a higher percentage of the town doing it. So that's why I'm in favor of putting the thing out on the ballot and letting the citizens in total make the decision and tell us what they want us to do. Thank you. Councillor Breton. Thanks. Um, I, um, I also support putting this on the ballot. I think that this is a, a really great opportunity. Um, and I do think it's time sensitive. I don't think these things come along. They've, we've heard that folks have been watching this parcel of land. It's the number one. Um, parcel, um, and I think we would lose that opportunity, and I, I feel like um, it would be a great legacy to to go this route and put it on the ballot and let the public decide. Um, I will say that I am a neighbor of this area. Um, spoke to some neighbors around our area. I do also share some of those considerations that folks were talking about, like um, traffic and noise and, and the like. And you know, unfortunately, as the mayor said, we're not in an opportunity right now where we can develop a sophisticated 
master plan. Um, but I feel like the way that it's been defined enables us to have a variety of uses that will benefit the community and the town. And I guess I just have a couple of clarifying questions, and maybe this will help other folks too. Um, we put it on the ballot and say it, it does pass, then um, a, we'll develop a master plan. And there'll be opportunity for folks to weigh in um, at various places right in the process at town council meetings, at planning and zoning, et cetera, on proposed uses, I would imagine, right? That would definitely be the case. That was how the Millwoods master plan, just as an example of one of the more recent ones, that it started out um, with a citizen group getting together uh, also at that time because it was a park already. Members of the Park and Recreation Board also were on it, and they discussed what what were the current needs in town and how would they best look at Mill Woods to make that happen. They hired a firm to come in to say, these are our needs, this is what we're looking to fit, and how can we make this happen? And then they developed, probably went through five or six drafts that went to, um, to the committee and then also ended up going to the public for input prior to anything ever being finalized. So it was a, a whole collaborative effort of the community. Right, and, and so that, that gives me even more confidence that you know it, it's as good as we make it as a community. If folks are concerned about some of those considerations, I think you know, there's your opportunity um, to weigh in. But I also do agree with Council Rell that we should provide whatever information we know of. Um, some of the, we can go through the minutes and, and see some of these considerations that folks have raised and provide some assurances before the vote. Um, I think that would be um, that would be appropriate. And one other question I had was um, we did talk about this municipal use. Um, people brought up the idea of community gardens or potential agriculture, and I just wanted to know whether that was within the construct of the way we've described it, um, community gardens, that type of thing. I I mean I'm thinking the answer is yes. So there's another potential. Would the would the town attorney come up so he can answer that question, please? Thank you for being here tonight. No, thank you. Of course, that's within the municipal purposes, and that's the reason for that uh, language, so that you don't uh, hamstring yourself and box yourself in because things change over years, as we've seen. It may be the needs could change, but uh, I think you've expressed the primary purpose as open space and recreational uses, but other municipal purposes would certainly be broad enough to include community gardens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, first want to thank the public for coming out, those that have left and those that are, are still here. I think we had about 50 people come, many of which spoke on both sides. Those things are very helpful to us. It's very uh, thoughtful to hear the residents give their opinions. Uh, my opinion is this opportunity doesn't come around too often. And it has a lot to do with the future of our town, the future of our community, what we want our community to look like, what our children, what our grandchildren, what kind of town are we going to have. And ultimately that decision will be decided by the voters uh, November 6th if we, if we vote to move it ahead in a few minutes. I'm in favor of moving it ahead. Uh, I think preserving open space and giving the town the opportunity here um, as opposed to a developer is the right decision for our town. I am realistic that this is expensive, but it's a cost that I think uh, is important for us to have control over that. And as I said before, the future of the town, this is one of these big decisions that the voters will decide on November 6th. And I hope they decide to preserve open space and to use it for recreational support. So I'm gonna support it going to the voters. But I do agree with Councilor Rell and Councilor Breton that we need to make all information available uh, to the public so they can make the informed decision but I think we would be missing a big opportunity if we didn't vote in favor of this. Thank you. Other counselors? Councilor Forrest. I've been told I'm supposed to speak directly into the microphone just like this. Thank Am you. Are doing well? All Thank right, you. Thanks. <laughs> Got a little scolding before, so to speak. Um, without totally regurgitating, regurgitating everything, uh, agree with all the counselors around here, information, 
sharing with the public. The public will obviously vote and make, be the final decision maker on this particular piece of land. Um, my, my thinking is uh, more long term than any two year term that I might have the pleasure of sitting in this particular seat and that would be to secure this land for the town and for its use. Just we've heard today um, whether we're talking about gardens or sport or space or agriculture or education, there are many, many positive uses of this land, all of which I believe will be taken into consideration if the voters and the town citizenry decides that this is a thoughtful purchase. Um, is the, the price is probably market price for the land. It's kind of my feel of it. Um, and while everybody likes to get a deal, this is the, the deal and the, and the terms that have been agreed to by the seller and by the potential buyers, which is the town, which are the town of Weathersfield. And so, in uh, on, on on balance, um, you know, there have been some discussions about how this is, uh, you know, three million dollars because you add in the nine hundred thousand dollars or seven hundred thousand dollars of interest over twenty years. But then, to be sort of fair to that argument, you'd also have to take into consideration twenty years of budgeting at a hundred million dollars a year, which is. You know, going to be over two or three billion dollars. So if you look at seven hundred thousand dollars over two or three billion dollars, it almost all of a sudden becomes a much smaller sort of factor, a true factor, but a smaller factor. And then I guess the, I think that the beginning number and and sure the sixteen dollars is the sixteen dollars. It is what it is, right? And and uh, but I, I think the sixteen dollars or the two hundred and something thousand dollars in debt service per year, which would reduce over the next twenty years. So that sixteen dollars or that two hundred and something thousand dollars would go down every year. Into the into the future as we pay off the bond, so I suppose that's another sort of consideration for all the taxpayers to take into consideration that that sixteen dollars will be fifteen dollars and fourteen dollars and thirteen dollars, as I understand it right here. Every all on balance, though, whether it's sixteen dollars or fifteen dollars, um, is this particular space good for the town of Weathersfield and for our citizenry? If we look at, um, I can't tell you how many times we've certainly heard lacrosse is sort of a, I'm gonna say up and coming sport is, is here sport. Um, and of course we have the football needs and the baseball needs and the field hockey needs and all the rest of the needs of the town of Weathersfield. And, and before I served here, I was on the board of education before that, six more years in the town council. And I've always heard of the strain on the fields. And that's one of the reasons that we went to the Catone field situation, which was non-grass so that we could get more use out of it and have a higher rate of use uh, without it being destroyed. So I think it's clear that there is a lot of pressure from the sporting community. Uh, there's certainly a lot of interest from the agricultural community and open space community and conservation community for this particular parcel to do a lot of good into the maybe forever future of this town. So knowing how old we are, I certainly support its placement on the ballot and the securing of this land for our future. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments, councilors? All right, I need a roll call vote for this. Okay, are we ready to vote? All right, go ahead, okay. Dolores. So, yes. Statement yes. of purpose to appropriate $2,470,000 for acquisition for recreational open space or other municipal purposes of approximately 32 acres of land at 303 and 310 Highland Street in the town of Weathersfield, known as Keisha Farms. Assessor's parcel numbers 099-002, 099 slash 003, 097-011, and 098-013, and all improvements and appurtenances thereto, Excluding approximately 0.5 acre parcel on the northwest corner of the property with frontage and collier road. Okay. I guess I just pulled it right. Yeah. Um, yes. Councillor Breton. Oh. Yes. Floor. <laughs> Actually, yes. Before, do, uh, <coughs> oh, do we say? Oh, yeah, I think we, we did, have to say. What what do we say? There's already we did on the make table. the motion in the second. Might have been a, a, re a reading of that. We did it. Right. We began with the motion in the okay. second. Do we have okay. the actual statement? Has that been read, or would should that be read into the record for what the statement on the November ballot will be? Is that yeah, coming? That's coming that's up under okay. council action. So we have Brett, uh, Council Breton, Council Forrest, yes, Council Hurley and Latina are out. Council Lesser, yes. Council Rao, yes. 
Councilor Spinella? Yes. Deputy Mayor Martino? Yes. And Mayor Morin Bello? Yes. Okay. Now you can do that one. This part here? Yeah, this whole paragraph? Yeah. I don't remember what. All right. Move that the bond ordinance approved at this meeting be submitted to a referendum vote in accordance with the town charter on November 6, 2018, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., in conjunction with the elections to be held on that date under the following ballot heading. Quote, shall the town of Wethersfield appropriate $2,470,000 for costs with respect to the acquisition of the Keisha Farm property on Highland Street for recreational comma, open space and other municipal purposes, comma, and authorizing the issue of bonds and notes in the same amount to finance such appropriation, question mark, close quotations. And that the town clerk publish a notice of passage and notice of such referendum and make absentee ballots available. Okay, Anybody? and do I have a second? S second. Okay, Councillor Breton. Yes. Councillor Forrest? Yes. Councillor Hurley and Latina are not here. Councillor Lesser? Yes. Councillor Rell? Yes. Councillor Spinella? Yes. Deputy Mayor Martino? Yes. And Mayor Morin Bello? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move to item. Uh, the ordinance amending chapter 153 shade tree commission do I have a motion yes move to approve ordinance amending chapter 153 shade tree commission second okay we have a motion and a second um, interim town manager are you discussing this I can sure <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the, the tree warden was here earlier yeah he left oh okay it doesn't matter. I could, it, if you want me to, or you could be my guest. Okay, okay. Councilor yeah. Breton. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to briefly summarize some of these these changes. Um, uh, there was the first change was um, in the section 153-11, um, and it had that subject matter of that section was the master street plan, um, and essentially in. An, the change was to add that the tree warden would review plans for planting for new commercial development. Um, so that's in line with, you know, keeping with kind of species and all the things that the tree warden looks at and, um, and recommends. But it's not, it's not approval, it's, it's just a review of the plan. Um, the second change, or I could stop if anyone has any questions, but I don't think anyone, just stop me if you have questions. Um, the second part is the second uh, change was under 153-12, and um, I know I'm going to have trouble saying this. Arbor, arboricultural species and standards um, on public spaces. Um, the addition was to use good planting practices, um, and the other addition was approval by the tree warden is required uh, for the removal of of any trees on public land. And then the last section was 153-15 under fines and penalties. Um, what was added there was, in addition, the um, tr that that any trees that were damaged and needed to be removed, um, the cost of removal would, or the cost of replacement um, to to the for the tree um, would be, you know, part of the penalty of the person who who did it. So. Any questions on those? Any councilors have questions? Comments? Councilor Forrest? Uh, not so much a question, but just a comment. It seems pretty thoughtful that when, if there's a car accident or someone runs into a tree and damages our stuff, that many times there is insurance monies that are there, not our insurance money, but other property damage insurance monies that are there. And it seems like these changes will enable us to, to make claims for the appropriate replacement value of trees should they be damaged, especially against the insurance companies. So that seems pretty thoughtful to me. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Rell? That just leads uh, me just a question. If 
uh, a motorist hits one of our trees, a, a town tree, and we are, it's close to the road, we've done all, you know, proper procedures to make sure there's no hanging limbs over the road, dead limbs, that the tree is, you know, sound and, you know, healthy and alive. Is the town liable at all for any accident that would occur because somebody had hit the tree and it wasn't their, you know, the fault of the, the motorist, but the, the tree was there and the, the car simply, you know, had a mechanical problem and, and you know, is there any liability on the town at all? I know Jack is here. Jack, <laughs> I know you love tree, tree liability issues. <laughs> The, the duty comes from, the town has a duty to keep and maintain the public highways in a safe, reasonably safe condition. And there's all kinds of, any, and the other factor is anyone can sue for anything. But sight line, obstruction of sight line, for example, at an intersection where the accident occurs and the investigation shows that the sight line was obstructed because of a tree within the public right-of-way, which was not properly maintained by the town, could give rise to liability on the town. Uh, there's, you can't answer uh, for all cases, but in general, the town has a duty to maintain its highways in a reasonably safe condition. And that could include uh, obstruction of sight line or other things uh, caused by a tree. I hope that begins mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. scratch the surface of possible uh, so in layman's terms what are we doing in this one sentence violation of 153-6 of the chapter shall be punishable by a fine not to exceed fifty dollars or such greater amount as may be allowed by statute and such person may be subject to such civil damages or criminal penalties yes as prescribed good uh, that does broaden the town's rights to go against somebody who causes damage to a town tree. And uh, you, the town would have the right to bring a civil action and recover fines, penalties, and attorney's fees in appropriate circumstances for damage to a town tree. And that's, that's what's being done in that section. Conversely, can, they, can that motorist? No. Because that tree, they hit that tree. <laughs> I'm just no. making sure that we are, yeah. you know, protected. Yeah, exactly. No. Okay. The, the motorist would not be able to recover mm -hmm. attorney's fees uh, under the circumstances that you described. But the statutes give the right of the town to bring an action for damage to town trees. Uh, and then you get into valuation of the trees. You know, you could say, well, you can buy a one foot tall arborvitae, but the one they ran over was 20 feet tall, you know, and you get valuation things. But uh, this is a very broad uh, statutory authority that, in favor, that favors municipalities on this issue. And has this proposal, and this isn't for you, Jack, but for the council, has this proposal been through Shade Tree Commission or any other? And they were okay with it. Yes, they they they've been reviewing this, and they move, they wanted to move forward with it. Yep. Okay. And they, the tree warden as well. And they've worked on this for, for since the spring. Yeah, since they, the spring. they've they've been meeting and discussing this since the spring. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mike, this uh, this thing about you know going after the insurance company, all this doing is putting in writing what the town has done in the past, because when I first started with the town down at physical services, if a, you know. There was a motor vehicle accident and ruined the town tree. The arborist got the value of the tree. We submitted it to the insurance company. We got reimbursed even back then. So that, that's a practice. This is just putting it in writing. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes. <clears throat>
So we are um, in other business now, the approval of the purchase of police cars. Do I have a motion? Oh, I guess that's it. Um, yes, uh, move to purchase four 2019 Ford Police Interceptor SUVs for the police department and remove four police vehicles that are past their life cycle. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And I see the police chief out in the audience. If he'd come on up, please. And if you could give us an, um, a, an overview on this. Thank you for coming tonight. You got a late night. <laughs> Um, I think it was probably about 15 or years ago that the council had decided on the best course of action in replacing police cars was a 5-4 decision, if you want to call it that. Um, five cruisers one year, four cruisers the next year. We've never gotten five. We've always done it with four. Four is the perfect number for the rotation that we've developed for the cars to keep the cars that the officers are driving in relatively good shape, um, that we don't run into a large mechanical costs for the cars, uh, and they still look pretty good. But we've never uh, gotten rid of cars that are not at the end of their life cycle. Um, the cars go through the administration and detective division first, then they go through patrol, then after patrol, those are the cars that have the high mileage on them, go through traffic, SROs, their officer, the, the cars, when they're not needed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So <clears throat> with that rotation, with that flow, four cars per year has done pretty good by us, and we don't get into a, a large amount of uh, cost for mechanical, we still get it periodically because cars aren't perfect, but it's not the, uh, the constant cars off the road that are getting, have to get transmissions and engines and things like that. So it, it works very well for us, and, and we've, we've had good luck with that number four per year. And don't forget those cars, when they are on patrol, they're doing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, that takes its toll on a car. We usually only get about two, two and a half years out of a car after patrol. We get two years, two and a half years out of a car when it's going through the administration and the detective division, so we normally get about five years out of a car, which is pretty good. It's not 40 years like a fire engine, but a fire engine isn't going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the people are. Never a good idea to have. <laughs> I do have. Um, there was something that was brought up, and I do have the mileage of some of the cars. I had them recorded today. Um, one of the line cars is 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 up there, and it's scheduled to be changed out with one of the cars that we we have received. It just takes a while for physical services to actually change over the cars because there's only one mechanic that's working on them. But we have a car that has 93,380 miles. That's a 2014. We have, uh, we have a car that's a 2014 that's in a, uh, a district that doesn't get used 24 hours a day. That has 115,000 miles on it. So the cars do get up there, but what we try to do is we try to rotate the cars through first the districts and then into uh, like the SROs and the their officer to, um, that get the real high mileage so they're not it's not mounting up all the time but it, it does flow fairly well um, council members do we have questions or comments councillor Rell are they the um, the crown vix the 2014 no. I mean that's pretty no, new. 2014 would the crown vic ended in 2012 we still have some crown vix uh, but they're not used on the line. The, those cars are the newer ones. But like I said, two, two and a half years in patrol, those cars are, are up there with mileage. Would any of these four replace any Crown Vicks? Yes. The Crown Vicks, once, 
what, what happens is when those cars that go to the SRO, the DARE officer, the, the traffic unit, then when they, they'll get pushed out by the newer cars that are coming through with the higher mileage on it. So yeah, eventually we'll, we won't have any more Crown Vicks. In fact, I, don't think, I only think we have like maybe two or three left. But don't forget too, those cars, the newest of the Crown Vicks are six years old now. Well, the ones that you're looking to replace are only four years old. 2014, 93,000 miles. No, well, the, those will go through the next step, which is the SRO officers. The, so they're, they're not going to get completely replaced and, and sold off. They're going to get... Right. Degraded. They're going to push they're, now the, yeah. the older ones out that were being used in traffic and the SROs and the DARE officer and where else that we need. The, the DARE officers, I mean, those cars really aren't very good for anything. They're, they're not really safe to be, definitely not safe to be using in patrol, but they're great to have parked at a school because it looks like the police are there. So it, it's, it works out very well for us. And plus you could, we couldn't use the same equipment that was on the Crown Vicks with the newer cars, the interceptors, because it's a totally different car. Now we're going to go through it again because Ford is retooling for 2020. The 2019s, their end of the 2019s to purchase, to order, is this month. It's September something. If we don't get that order in now, then we won't be able to get the cars until much later in the year. So can I just, to clarify, sure. the, um, the four cruisers that are, that are being purchased t today, okay. what, that are being approved today if they are, yeah. they um, are going to push out the 2014s from patrol down the line, but the, those... No, there's another step. See, there's the first step that we do in the rotation is they'll go through the administration and the detective division. They'll stay as unmarked cars. There's, it's we call it administrative package. Mm -hmm. The administration, those cars now, when they're replaced, will go into patrol. And that's when they get the, the hardest use. Okay. Once they, once they come out of patrol, they'll go into those other places, and those cars will then get sold off at auction. So the cars that get sold off at auction, how many years, how, how old are those cars and how many mileage is on them? Uh, I don't have that right here, but I do know that those are the cars that have the highest mileage and are the oldest. Those would be some of those Crown Vicks you were yes, talking about? Yes, probably all of them, yeah, all of them, right? I would think. They're six years old now, and they're not, um, they're not really used for any kind of police work. Even traffic, I would be afraid to use them. And do some of, those, do some of the police cars come over to the town at some not point? Not anymore. Oh, that, no, we yeah. don't do that anymore. No, no. Not anymore. we used to do that, but um, not anymore. Uh, the cars really weren't in the best of shape. I think Kathy can attest to that. Um, she's I still have driving. the last Crown Vic, yeah. only because it works well for a park and rec vehicle yeah. to carry stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like a pickup truck. Yeah. Councilor Lesser. Thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> Chief, the cars that are four four years old are they getting? Uh, abnormal wear and tear so when, when I think of a four-year car I think of a pretty new car and if we're and I'm not saying we're replacing them I know they're kind of moving down the line but can you comment on that because to, to a layman that seems like a fairly new car yeah it would my personal car yeah I got one that's 20 years old <laughs> uh, no uh, what uh, if after the two and a half two to two and a half years in administrative division and a detective division the car usually has between I would say between 15 and 20,000 miles. So when patrol gets the car, they're still fairly new. Uh, Deputy Mayor actually looked at our cars at the time a couple of years ago, and we showed them exactly how the pro progress went. When those cars now go into patrol, that's when they get the most abuse because they are going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, most of them. There are different, they're in different districts. Different districts have different mileage. So what we try to do to keep the car the longest is to actually start moving cars from different districts so that they'll get more, you know, less mileage on one car because it's gained mileage from another district. So th there's a plan, there's a, a flow that they actually have that, that works pretty well. 
So when the cars get through after patrol, they're pretty beat. I mean, these are the cars that are going to have 90, 80 to 100,000 miles on it. When you start getting up to 80 to 100,000 miles, now you start having the issues with safety. Uh, if a car, needs, if it goes in, going to have a pursuit or if you have to respond to a call that you need to get there quick, quickly, a, what they call a code three, you don't want to be driving a car that has 100,000 miles on it because even though they, the mechanics are great and they keep them up in, in pretty good shape, you can't trust the car when it has that many miles on it. Um, Chief, to your knowledge, do, do most towns have a similar type cycle where they're maybe replacing four or five cruisers a year uh, as, as we've been doing in Wethersfield or past practice, um, to the best of your knowledge? Yes, there are other towns that do it. Our neighbors don't. Newington does it a completely different way. What Newington does is they, they purchase actually two sets of cars. They have, uh, and they, what they do is they, I think they, I'm pretty sure they purchase four or five cars per year, but three will be new interceptors that go into patrol directly, and one or two will go into the administration and the detective division. They separate the two cars, so you actually have like two fleets. But the problem with that is you get much less time out of a cruiser, the, the ones that go through patrol. So they're actually purchasing more cars uh, over the period of time. Our plan, the way we've done it, we've been doing this for over, I bet you it's got to be close to 50 years. Uh, works very well for us. We don't have as many cars like in Rocky Hill. Rocky Hill almost has enough cars. What they do is they assign one car to two officers. Now that car lasts a long time because one, because the officers have the car, it's their car, they keep it very well. It's not on the road 24 hours a day because it's only between two officers, it's only on the road 16 hours a day. So, but they have a lot more cars than we do. We've got a larger department, but they have more cars and they last longer. So for them, they think that that's, that's their policy, that's their procedures and they like it. I, we have less cars, but in my opinion, we have better cars. So um, I like the, the program that we've, saw, that we've had and that we've kept for the last 50 years. Okay, thank you. Um, also, could you talk to the fact that um, these cars may not have as many miles? I mean, I've got a car with 150,000 miles on it, but it's yes. not sitting idle no, 24 right. hours it's, a day either. And I know police cruisers yes. are running all yes. the time. And that could you talk right. to that because that, sure. there must be engine, it, you know, wear from just having it yeah. running. Right. All it's the not time. the same 100,000 miles that you could get on your Subaru at home. No, it's it's. Um, the, I don't want to say it's abuse, but it is actually, um, that's why they, they're, they're so beefy. That's why they have the heavier suspensions, the, the bigger engines, the, the better transmissions, um, because of that reason. They're idling all the time. You can't shut them off, because if you shut them off, then the computer shuts off, and uh, then you would have to reboot the whole thing all over again. So that's one of the reasons why we got those um, trembles, the, so the car... Nobody can like smash a window, get into the car, and drive off with it because there's a special lock that's in there uh, because the car has to run all the time. Uh, yeah, the idle time is astronomical. It's and you don't add it, you don't see it on the mileage of the car, but it's there. Uh, Tony can attest to that. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, when that car, when that Ford Interceptor, Crown Vic, hits the 100,000 mile mark, that, that car is done. It, it, it really can't be used in police work anymore because, uh, like I said, uh, you've got multiple drivers, three shifts per day, every day of the week. Um, they, they, I mean, I'm proud of those cars. They, they do last well for, the, for what they have to go through. Um, they're not babied like fire engines, but... <laughs> You'll get your <laughs> <laughs> You do get the we last don't. laugh. I'll <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <That'll> be next. <laughs> stick, around, um, stick around, Chief. <laughs> how, how, many, um, how many cruisers are in your, in your fleet? How many cars do you have? Um, 25, I think. There's, I mean, there's animal control van. I mean, you're talking right, about the cruisers? Yeah. Oh, yeah cruisers, I, I believe there's, what was it? 20, 
three twenty four cruisers. So, so it's basically a six year life um, yeah. of the vehicle. Then, if we're replacing four every year, you should, yeah. you know, every six years you've replenished your right. your fleet. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments, Councillor Rell? Oh. Um, like You're deferring to no, Councillor Forrest. Um, th thanks, Ken. thank you, yeah. um, Chief. I've uh, been following sort of the transition of, of some really great vehicles into electrification, right? What Tesla is sort of the name you think about, but there are lots of other manufacturers who are moving into this into this realm. And in sort of following that uh, market, I guess you might say, there's a lot of police departments that are really starting to take those cars into consideration because they're um, uh, first of all the ga the the equivalent of a gas is about 33 percent of the price of our gas and and uh, and the maintenance of them is significantly lower some estimates are almost 90 percent and they might go a million miles and that's not like a joke and just out there like these cars are just really from a transmission standpoint so would you consider uh, and for pretty similar prices comparably but so would you consider starting to think about the electrification of the fleet as we start talking a little bit longer term but not that much longer because these cars are being made and police departments are really starting to um, I don't want to say investigate that's sort of a police term but yeah. we move into that uh, as as this council sort of reviews how, we're, how we work on that so that we might be able to if we can find products that are not five-year products that are much longer um, and they might have a lot of other fun capabilities like if you don't turn one off, if you turn it off, you don't actually turn it off and the computer systems can run. So those types of concerns might be allayed. Um, I'm wondering if you'd be interested in considering some of those things to see if they would uh, be a good fit. I, I would consider anything. But if you remember correctly, I, in fact, I'm not sure if you were on the council at the time. Remember we experimented with the natural gas and the cruiser blew up out here? Right. Who we'll put it out, Chief? <laughs> Some guy in a red truck on it. <laughs> That was good, Rich. Losing control With an old here. fire truck. 43-year-old fire truck. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I, I would entertain this, this anything. This looks a little bit, diff yeah. looks would, a little bit different than that. I would, right, entertain right. anything. I would entertain anything. I would actually look at that. I, I, I know some of the electrification of some of the vehicles are, are stopped, but normally there's a much higher cost to that vehicle. At least there has been anyways. Um, but, yeah, I'll entertain anything. As long as it works as a police car, that's all I care about. It's safe. And they can get the officers to the calls that are needed sure. to get to. I'm um, for anything. But say, hey, I'm a taxpayer too. You know, I I, yeah. I I want to save money, and we try. We really, really do. I think that system that we've developed has shown that through the years we we actually have been pretty efficient with the cars. If you do hear of anything or in any of the research that you do and so on and discussion, mm -hmm. I know you're part of the police chief association, yeah. etc. Um, you know, if there's discussion about that, I'd like to open a dialogue with you to see if, if that might there, be a good as fit. As soon as I hear about budget. it, I will let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rell? My con thank you, Chief. My concern now turns away from the need for vehicles, be it two fire trucks, four police vehicles. Now my concern focuses on what I think Mike O'Neill had uh, prepared. It's both in the... Um, Council packet and uh, another more updated copy here for uh, for us to look at. This is the lease payments that uh, we have, and I know. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you. I'm not <laughs> directing my questions to you, Chief. Yeah. Uh, I don't expect you to answer questions about lease payments. Uh, I know uh, Mike Hurley last two weeks ago at the last meeting had brought up the concern about the bump up from close to 700,000, it's the, the yellow highlighted mark, uh, almost to the middle of the page, 678,000 um, in lease payments that we're, we're expected to pay uh, now. With the inclusion of the fire truck, uh, or two fire trucks, um, police vehicles, uh, dump trucks, rolling stock, as well as the 317,000 for street lights, which may or may not, we might not recoup as much back from those uh, those street lights. We're going up nearly you know, seven nine hundred thousand dollars up to um, you know 1.6 million dollars. Take out the street lights, you know, it's a little bit less, 300,000 dollars less. Our lease payments are going up and up and up 
And I know we just approved the um, the ballot uh, question for the voters to decide whether or not to spend three point four million dollars over the life of twenty years. <laughs> More of my concern is is how much are we putting on the, the town credit card? You know, how much more are we putting out there? Um, hearing from the chief, you know, and, and knowing about the fire trucks, yes, you know, 1975 is a, a long ways ago. 1992 refurbished. Um, but unless I hear differently, I don't know if there's any mechanical problems that are going on with these vehicles right now, except for high mileage. Um, I believe the parts are still available for, for some of them. Um, should we be putting these on the credit card right now to, uh, um, you know, continue the, the, the more payments? And, you know, the out years are going up, you know, exponentially as well, um, all above the, the current amount. Um, we're in the million, million and a half range. Um, you know, it's concerning to me. Kathy, is this something you can address, or should we ask Mike O'Neill to come up? We can certainly ask Mike to come up, too. And it is we, because we are looking at the police cars and the fire trucks tonight. It, it does show a, a bigger jump because of the police cars were identified in the budget in CNEF this year. So that was, that was always a budgeted item. And now we're looking at what those lease payments would be. Uh, the fire trucks, they've been discussing it since January with uh, the Public Safety Committee and recently had another meeting. So it's been in the works, just hadn't made the budget process at that point in time. So the, the two fire trucks, the police vehicles are in the CNEF. The two trucks are not, though. Correct. Okay. And Mike can speak more, excuse me, Mike can speak more to the leases themselves. Please. Thanks, Thanks for Mike. being here, Mike. Sure, Mike O'Neill, Director of Finance. Um, I guess just to very briefly, mostly repeat um, what you said, Councillor Rell, but um, budgeted lease payments for the current fiscal year, there are 11 lease agreements um, outstanding. Um, those, the payments on those 11 leases, which are for various items from the townwide radio, to uh, police vehicles, a fire truck, um, the turf, etc. Total is 1.1 million. That's just principal and interest in this current fiscal year on those 11 leases. Um, we used $395,000 worth of reserves to offset that 1.1 million, and that gets us to the to the figure that was mentioned earlier, the 678,000. That's what's in the the operating budget in the current fiscal year. Um, the bottom of the sheet is just to add to that those other um, items that are kind of in the works being discussed, et cetera, um, and that gets us to uh, next year a million six, which includes the street lights, which again, that is included in the analysis because it's a lease, um, but again, it's designed cash flow wise to the savings would offset the three hundred seventeen thousand okay. dollars of lease payment mm -hmm. for the year. The two rolling stock question marks. Do we know what those? This is in today's nine four um, two thousand eighteen. That was added just to kind of remind everyone that with the police vehicles, we lease over three years. And, and the pattern in the past has been to purchase vehicles every year. So as you look out These in those columns, the out years. there's something else coming every year. We don't know what it would be. You know, the, the hard figures that are on there are purchases that have been approved or, mm -hmm. or that are a little more tangible than the, the, you know, going out in fiscal 20 and beyond. But again, though that question marks were just put there to remind people that the vehicle purchases have occurred on an annual basis. Okay. Thank you. Mike, could you give us, um, I don't know if, if you have it now, but could you give us a little history? Um, how long has the town 
used this model. I know um, years ago they, the, the town was purchasing items outright, but at some point in time, um, a finance director, a council decided it was, um, it, the, the process to go out and lease these things seemed to make more fiscal sense. Um, do, you, do you know how long that has occurred? Um, and is it still, I mean, it looks like it's still a good model for us. Um, I know the former town manager felt strongly that it was a good model for us, and I, I think you do as well. Could you just talk to that, please? Sure. Um, I started in 2014, and this program was had been in place for several years um, at that point. And really, my understanding is that it came about because of the extremely low interest rate environment um, that kind of really took hold in 2009, 2010. Um, these are our tax exempt leases, so there's a lower rate than if you went out to buy a vehicle, if you or I went out to buy a vehicle. Um, that, in, in addition to just, like I said, the low interest rate environment is, is, as I understand it, you know, the decision was made to go to this model in the past. And we're still, you know, the interest rates are, are they are starting to creep a bit, but, you know, they're still, you know, very favorable. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll take a, um, we have a motion and a second, so I'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Okay, did you get that, Dolores? Mm -hmm. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, appreciate your time. All right, next up, purchase of fire trucks. Do I have a motion? Councilor Forrest? Yeah, there should have called me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to move to authorize the purchase of two fire apparatus to replace two existing pumper, pumpers at a total cost of $1,142,620 and enter into a lease purchase agreement for purposes of financing the purchase. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We have the fire chief and deputy here. Assistant, Assistant excuse me. I tried with the title, my apologies. <laughs> Good evening, Rich Bailey, fire chief. Um, as a counselor said, and then left. Um, we are looking for two, <coughs> two pumpers. Uh, it'd be replacing a 1989 Suffin Ranger and a 1975 American La France. Um, I can open the questions. I have some bullets we can talk about. Um, you know, it's it's all about safety, wear and tear, repair costs, parts availability. You know, there are parts that are being made you know, that we have specially made for some of these vehicles as they break down. Um, the preventative maintenance is obviously getting higher every year. The possibility of chassis and components failure, um, the aging parts again, the cost and repair of these, you know, and it's about being smart to the taxpayers too. You know, for any of you who know me, I, I don't come in front of you with desires. Never have, never will. I come to you with needs. When the fire department needs something, I'm taxed with protecting 27,000 people the best I can. And the most important 27,000 of those people are the 75 of my firemen. This does that. This puts us in a place as far as engines, the, the next staff won't be in front of you for 10 years. You know, this puts us in a very good place. It makes us fiscally responsible. And as we've said several times, it's a 30-year vehicle, if not longer. Um, we do, you know, I know there's some shiny fire truck comments from people I've never seen at a fire before. But uh, if it was a showpiece for the weekend, you know what? Keep it. Let it run up time. These are emergency vehicles. And they'd be at, at any one of our houses at any given time with people in them that I got to send home to their families as well. Um, there is, 
and I'm not going to say fear, but there is a concern of catastrophic failure of these pieces. The pump goes, the tranny goes, the motor goes. You know, these are 30-year-old vehicles. And again, it, it does have a lot different. If you have a 30-year-old antique in your garage that you take out on weekends, you know, it's, this is an emergency vehicle. It has to be updated and the best of its ability at any given moment. Um, I'd be open to questions. Um, I'll open the floor in a minute, but is the, do, is the town, does the town have any cost savings in purchasing two at one time? Yeah, we talk, I spoke with Kathy about that today. There, there are different um, budgeting strategies, I'll say, and I'm not going to look at you and pretend to know them. That would be more for Mike and, and Kathy, but I'm sure there is. Um, do, do any council members have questions? Deputy Mayor? Uh, Rich, uh, I, I know how the CNAF budget works normally before mm -hmm. the budget comes forward. You know, the staff, mainly the people down in physical services, they review all the vehicles and all the requests mm -hmm. and come up with a list. I'm just wondering, I mean, with the condition of these vehicles, were these in your request when CNF was put together last year? CNEF? Yeah. No. Because it wasn't known at the time that they were in such? Yes, but I've never, I've never put engines or trucks into CNEF. You know, we've gone to the manager, you know, whoever it may be at the time, with the request, with the information. Now, if there was a lease payment that came out of CNEF, again, I, I've never seen it, but that certainly doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. Okay, because I remember years ago, the fire trucks were in the list of things that mm -hmm. the group decided on as to what should we, you know, go out to, to buy. The, there was a budgetary list similar to the one I gave you guys in your right. packet, which has years of service. We that was more of a uh, five and ten year outlook, which we did what was going to need mm -hmm. to be replaced, and you know sometimes budgetary, you know, things don't allow it. Right. But you know we're just we're getting to the point of we're just about at the point of no return where where we have to really start worrying about that catastrophic failure. You know, knock on wood, obviously nobody wants anybody to get hurt. I understand that. No, but, I just uh, wanted to be sure that it wasn't on a list and got pushed back for something else because, you know, that it was cheaper and, you know. No, I would, I would have That's to go back to that five and ten year look, back, look out, I should say, and they're on there. Yeah, okay. You know, they're on there. And again, like you said, we plan for a 30-year truck. That's how we build them. That's, you know, if it lasts 28 or 35, you know, this is a one of them is a 1975 refurbished in 92. So it got, mm -hmm. you know, it got cleaned up a bit, but you know, that's not, you know, new chassis and everything that's, you know, new, new body and made it safe. Thank you. Other questions? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Chief, do we have any other vehicles that in the next couple of years you may be coming back that are nearing that 30 or maybe older than that but are not in good condition or do you think this is the uh, yes but nothing as significant as this now you know when i say that there's there's frontline pumpers there's frontline trucks we have a mini pumper that uh came in at the same time as the lafrance 1975 it's a gmc gas job we use it mainly for the meadows um is that number it, 15 uh, engine 15 15 yes. right okay. yeah you know and it does get used but it's not i don't want to say it's not a front line because it is but it, it's something that right now we it's suitable for our need so you don't anticipate in the next couple of years coming for anything in the next size. couple no, no probably no. in the next five year we could do a five-year lookout for you but there's not going to be a major engine truck purchase no i think it's our oldest towers in 97 so that would probably be coming up yeah, so that's yeah, years, 98 so. would be another, yeah, yeah. Okay. another 10 years. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Other questions? Councilor Rell? The reason why the American La France from 75 wasn't part of any prior, um, you know, uh, replacement is because it was refurbished in 92? Well, the last purchase we had, which replaced a 1980, I believe, uh, 80 foot 
area was at Company 2. Now that, that goes into the difference of engine in a truck. Not every fire engine's a truck, not every fire truck's an engine. So we needed to replace a ladder. So it wasn't significant for us to replace an engine as far as the 1975 when we purchased the new ladder four years ago. That was one for one in a swap. We're also in a size constraint. We have two very small bays, one at Company 3, one at Company 2. The one at Company 3 houses the spare, Engine 33, the 1975 LaFrance, and uh, 1992 LaFrance, um, Suffin at Company 2. Small engines, small bays. So we are in a size constraint in that one capacity. Does Has that answer been, it or no? <laughs> yeah, I kind of get it. I mean, I'm looking at the the vehicles right now, and it looks like it was replaced in 2015. The 70, the 80-footer was replaced with the 75-footer. Yes, yes, so, 75. And then that was in 2015. So that was the most recent purchase, and prior yeah, I, to that. I know, think it was 14. Maybe we may have started paying for it in 15, yeah. Okay. Um, how... So what's the real problem with the uh, um, American LaFrance, the 1975? You know, is it just... The real problem is it's it's old. And, and again, we get into, you know, I get it. It's not, it doesn't have 300,000 miles on it, and it's old, and the parts are starting to fail. You know, steel over 40-something years, we'll say. You know, it's, it, it's the spare, and it's the spare for a reason. You know, mm -hmm. it's got old technology. It's got old... You know, a 43-year-old pump, 43-year-old axles, 43-year-old everything. You know, and things are getting old, and replacement parts are very difficult. Is it your goal or the department's goal to get all the trucks, engines, aerials, uh, ladders to one manufacturer? Yes. And are they they're right here in Hartford? Uh, the, the well, they're garages. they're dealers, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, is they're American, out of Ohio. Is American LaFrance still in business? No, they they made some garbage trucks actually for a while and then went out of business. Okay. And along that line, for training purposes too, if we go with one manufacturer of that type, same type of apparatus, it takes less up for our guys to get the training. Once they're trained on one piece of apparatus, to transition to another and another one is less time for them, and they know it better. Gotcha. Instead of, you know, have to learn this piece, this piece, and that piece. So it is a, it's a training issue, too, we're trying to... Uh, and the mechanics for repair. Mm -hmm. You know, one manufacturer, one set of parts. They can fix one, they can fix them all. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions from Council? Councilor Forrest? Uh, not so much a question, but I guess I'll just sort of go out there and I'll say I think that these requests are very reasonable. And um, I don't come from a firefighting family, and I think we all have sort of our areas where maybe our families come from, whether it's police or fire, legal or administrative, or whatever part of society you're in. But I have a lot of respect, and I think that it's our, I think it's our responsibility as a town, as a council, to provide you guys with, and women, uh, the appropriate equipment to do your job. If you're going to run into a fire and be that person that does that job, I think it's our response, and, and it's a volunteer fire department. I know what it would cost to not be a volunteer fire department, and if we thought 41 mils was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not even in the 40s anymore. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so with that, I think that it's our responsibility to ensure that we've got good technology, and considering the age of the engines, the respect, uh, uh, the respect to the request, and uh, from all the knowledge that I have of the fire department over the last 15 years sort of doing my thing and I know I haven't been at all the ceremonies and dinners mm -hmm. and all that but I do my best with my position to see that you guys are in a good position to do yours so no we certainly appreciate that I think that I think it's I think it's a responsible request it's a ton of money and I've never seen a fire truck not be a ton of money, so that's not, yeah. It's yeah, that's you know it's not, hard, but it's a thirty-year purchase, and I know it's hard to look thirty years down the road. But I was there when we did the, you know the ones that you know were ten, fifteen years ago, and they were still like one point four million for one car for one truck. Yeah, like the big, the big uh, ones. ladder trucks are much more expensive. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. uh, and I remember we had a you know we had to swallow when we did that. But yeah, we was do we needed it, but yeah. So um, I think it's very reasonable. We certainly be voting for it, and. Um, 
like anything else, you just ask that you treat the babies well. And we do. You we do. always, and you know, know these you guys take premier care. And uh, I hope that the council will uh, support this as well. Thank you. All right. Are there any other yeah. questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Appreciate you staying so late. Um, our next item of business, we have no bids and we have no ordinances, resolutions for introduction. We'll move to the minutes of the August 20th regular meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. <clears throat> okay. Are there any changes, corrections, or deletions to the minutes? Okay. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, next is public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. If you would come up and give your name and address. Come on up, Mr. Colantonio. Good evening again, Gas Colantonio, 16 Morrison M. This is a record, three times in one meeting. It's, it's a lot. But uh, thank you for uh, addressing the light bulb, I guess. You know, that was replaced right away on my street. It was good. Uh, finally, for the town manager, uh, the, that uh, evergreen that uh, they were supposed to be cut on uh, just west of the driveway, it's out now, and it's much Beautiful. I mean, it's easy to see it. And, uh, but I noticed uh, the town attorney today says that uh, if you guys do not keep, uh, you know, things the way they should or you infringe on the site distance, that's what he said, you're liable if something happens. So two years ago, two years ago when that accident was, the people coming out of that driveway, it was because they could not see up the road. If I were them, I would have sued the town. And also, again, because the town attorney mentioned the side distance, before the reconstruction of the sidewalk, there was no problem at Tifton and Morrison Avenue. But because Morrison Avenue was moved to the south, they created a side distance restriction. So based on what it is now, posted speed limit, 25 miles per hour, 85th percentile goes to 31 miles per hour, and that intersection is only good for about 23 miles per hour. So in reality, you're telling the people that they could go faster than what's posted, and it's not right. So, and I'm going to be talking about this all the time. I'm not giving up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Mr. Young? Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Another expensive night here in Weathersfield. Just keep borrowing and borrowing. You know, the talk about $16 and $15 a year per, per, per taxpayer, per, per, per whatever you want to call them, and how it's going to decrease over the few years, every year decrease, we're going to see it not decrease. We're going to see that decrease. We're going to see the increases happen as you keep borrowing more money to do whatever it is you want to do on that property. We see that all the time. Turf, as I said earlier, $1.4 million 18 years ago, and last year, or a couple of years ago, you put more turf on at $1.2 million. No consideration of how you're going to pay for it when you go and buy. And you're not considering how you're going to pay for it either, except tack it on to the taxpayer. I, I don't understand how you people think. Uh, I think in the real world, you, none of you could do what you're doing here on your own. Even the town couldn't do it if they went to the bank and got a mortgage. You would have to prove yourself. You can go out and get bonds so easily today. 
and pay dear, you know, pay whatever the rate is, but look what, look, you're going to be sending a payment now of what, $1.1 million for a, a number of leases that you have going out. And, and next, uh, what did Mike say? Next year is going to be 1.6. And now tonight you just approve some more things. And as it keeps going, that 1.6 will become more and more year after year. It's not going to reduce $16 to $15 to $14. That's pie in the sky, and that's not realistic. It's not realistic from the point of the overall property, what it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us dearly. And, people, and I hope the citizens understand that. It's just like throwing more money in a big dark hole. Nobody wants that for a builder. Yeah, he might want it for putting in, what, how many lots is it supposed to be able to hold? 30? 25, 30? Do we know what that is? What the lots, what the lot yield is on that property? Because it's not a heck of a lot after you put roads in. And, have, and, and what is it zoned for? Half acre or is it, or, or is it a third acre? Someone mentioned that, but he didn't follow through. He mentioned some other properties that were half acres and others that were a third acre. I, I don't know what that property, again, we don't have enough information from you folks because you failed, failed to provide. Yet tonight you passed something to send it out to the voters. We probably won't know much more than we know tonight come November 6th. And we'll all be paying dearly. Hopefully this, the people are smart enough to say no to it. So, you know, you keep borrowing and borrowing. And realistically, you can't do that. Only a town can because, as I said, the town just keeps assessing, assessing the taxpayers. And again, we, we were sold on the idea of the Wilkes Farm, it was going to improve the prices of our homes. Has it been improving the prices of our homes? Two weeks ago in the Hartford Current, Weathersfield was a line item in that real estate section of, I didn't bring it with me, unfortunately. And it showed the price of average home, and it showed it went down 10.6%. 10 10 I wish I brought that in. I will next time. But it said it went down 10.6%. And what did the cost, what did the value of a home go down last year from 2016 to 17 per the budget? It went down 8,300 bucks. Are we continuing to dribble down and down? And furthermore, another subject. You talk about you don't really, I mean, you want to do all these grando, grandiose things on the, on the Kisa farm, such as preventing someone from buying it and putting in 30 or 40 houses. You were raving about that, those home sites over on Reservoir Road. The council at that, that was the last council was raving about, oh yeah, we're going to get them lots in there. We're going to allow them to put a highway, a roadway through. You gave them the right. You could have held them back and stopped it. But no, you didn't. You allowed it to happen. So what, what do you really want? Okay, Mr. Young, what do you time really is up. want? You, yeah, you, you, you say one thing and then you do another thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing no one else to speak, um, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. I move we go into executive session. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you.